some of your metal. At the start. Where should I look, actually? Oh, that's your camera. Okay. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. At Cabinets HR, we've launched our crowdfunding campaign on Refunder. To learn more and be an early investor, go to https semicolon backslash backslash refunder.com slash Cabinets HR. Our guest today is Nithal Parak. Nithal, are you ready to be great today? Yes, ready for it. So Nithal, what do you like to do for fun? Oh, um, I love hiking in the Pacific Northwest. And I love um, listening to audiobooks and podcasts. So sometimes there's some combination of walking, being in motion and listening, which can be, and with a view, which can be really joyful. Yeah. So what's the farthest hike you've been on? You know, here um, I have a few favorites that are fairly short, like one to two hours. Um, I tend to just go to the same ones. I don't, you know, I feel like it's the same hike, but with the seasons changing, it feels like different, you know, so it's good. Yeah. So any other things you do? Uh, I like hanging out with friends and, you know, and going to different, there's so many different events um, in the area. Um, I live in Tacoma, so there's lots of cool week events on the weekends and stuff. So fun to meet up with friends and check some of that stuff out. So that's kind of where the Seattle area, we have an entrepreneur that lives in Tacoma, right? So everything's in Seattle, right? Is that, <laughs> is that you just live there because it's cheaper down there or that's, that, why, why Tacoma versus Seattle? Um, I, I don't know. I feel like Tacoma called, kind of called me to it. Like I, uh, I actually took the bar exam in Tacoma years ago. Um, and it, you know, I grew up a little bit in Eastern Washington. So in Pullman outside of Spokane and I visited Seattle, but um, when I spent some time in Tacoma, it was just a very special feeling. And then when I was looking to spend some more time in the Pacific Northwest, um, Tacoma has such a unique profile. Like there's universities, there's the port, uh, there's the art scene. And um, since I've been here, there's also, I feel like a lot of entrepreneurship um, happening, you know, and I, I always say it's like a renaissance happening in Tacoma with entrepreneurs. You've been a good point. Like, I don't think people realize how many universities and colleges are in down in Tacoma. Like, they're like four, four or five, right? There's yeah. all that talent down there. And of course, you most of them have to go to Seattle for jobs, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess now with the ecosystem growing there, hopefully people are, you know, creating companies, making jobs, and then also can remote work. So mm -hmm. maybe can be in Tacoma and work in different places. Yes. And um, how often do you go back home to India? Um, so my family's from India, from Bombay, from Mumbai. Um, and my both my parents were born and brought up there. Um, growing up, it was really important for my mom that we had a connection to India and my, and my dad too. So we went every few years growing up. And so a lot of cousins and family I feel close to now, it's been, actually, it's been a while. I mean, with add COVID to all of that, you know. So it's been um, probably since before COVID. So I'm hoping to make it out there um in the next you know year or so so your parents moved her from india yes and you know the reason why they moved is like a, yeah. a guest job or well, like... my it was my my dad came for his undergraduate education he was in detroit and then in oklahoma then did his graduate school and his mba in oklahoma then went back to india um, married my mom and then she came and so you know they have an incredible migration story and then my dad's a civil engineer um so we moved a lot growing up because with a civil engineer you go to the job, you build the project, and then you go to the next job. So moved like maybe 20 times before I was 20. Like, you sound like me being in the military. Yes, yes. I I, I relate a lot to people. Like, like people don't realize yeah. how much movement sucks. Like yeah. in the army, even though they do everything for you to a point, right? You still got to pack stuff up, you know, yeah, wrap stuff up. Unless yeah. you do like every year, you're yeah. it, it, it fucking sucks. Yeah. Especially, I mean, your kids like change your friends and stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. That was, it really, I think it's shaped a lot of my personality. I wonder for you too, if it's shaped a lot of, yeah. because, um, I feel like there's this strengths finder test, which is really cool, called mm -hmm. Clifton Strengths Finder. You get your top five strengths, and my top one was adaptability. And I think it's almost a survival skill. Yeah. I think it's because we had to be right. You too. We had to. Yeah. You had to go to a new place, and you don't know anyone, and you don't know what the culture is like. You have to kind of jump in. And, and sometimes, like I, I feel good because my kids move around, like the adaptability, they make friends, whatever. And then I feel bad, like man, they like had to make new friends all the time, yeah. you know. And like yes, I don't know, it's pros and cons to it, I yeah. guess, you know. Yeah, well, I wonder, you know, in the civil engineering community, a lot of the times the teams move together. So we would know my dad's colleagues and their kids. In yeah. military, maybe it's similar. No, no not no, at all. Going on, yeah. Okay. It might be like in Fort Lewis today and 
six months and all you're getting okay. right. so you won't know any of your people like they won't be you, coming you might you. know because different things yeah now, but yeah it's not the same yeah yeah yeah, yeah. No, it's, 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 so is, do you have is it you have a dual citizenship with us in india no oh no i was born in oklahoma city okay <laughs> so, so um, um and they have can you, can you get a dual citizenship there's not a dual citizenship with india but you can get an oci card right. which is kind of like a long-term visa um i probably should do that because i would but you know but visas are not dif so, so mm -hmm. difficult to get you just have to plan it but um but yeah i've have had, have had a chance to do some volunteer work mm -hmm. and internships in india so um it it feels special in a lot of ways okay. but try to make what's no problem you just fly where you want to there's no like yeah you just have to get it you have to just okay. have to have visa and a valid okay. passport yeah you know. okay um so obviously you know india is a real large country many like uh, tribes dialects you know different personalities but from your own small perspective what do most americans get wrong about the country of india yeah i think um, actually, even there are dialects, just like there are of English, but in India, there are actually more languages. So every state has often its own language. Um, there's two main like kind of sets of languages or, or origins. There's the like Dravidian based languages and the um, Aryan based languages. So if you go to South India, like Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, um, those are all have a similar base but it's a different base than if you go to northern or central india like gujarati hindi punjabi so those so i think people kind of think oh these are all like the same but they're actually quite different like the culture the the source the kind of source of that base of that language is different as well there are different cultures there are different religions and in many places they coexist pretty peacefully and then there are things that are not but i yeah i think um I think maybe people don't realize how like vast it is and how many things coexist that are actually quite different from each other, maybe if that makes sense. It does. So I know like if you go to Thailand or China, you know, the food tastes totally different from what the American Thailand. It's the same in, like here's like in, in Indian food here in the United States, like way different from actual like, Indian food in Yeah, Asia. I mean, I can only speak from my experience because my family is is from Bombay, Mumbai, but from an area called Gujarat. So we we grew up having like Gujarati food, but a lot of the food that's in restaurants is often like Punjabi food or South Indian food. Um, and that is, I find delicious, but it's not uh, our regular day-to-day -day food was more like you know, regular kind of food. There's not as many, there are some Gujarati restaurants that have the food that we grew up with, but it's more like the everyday food. So I feel like um, a lot of places when you go, I don't know if in Thailand, people are having Pad Thai for dinner every night maybe it's a special food you know like that you have once in a while so a lot of the restaurant food i think is a special food that you might have you know um and indian food is like really spicy right it can be i mean okay. yeah it can be and it, you know um, i think that the spice palette is yeah. a unique one that often base level people find might find a little spicy yeah i'm going to, to visit thailand one time my family because my wife has a cousin that lives there and you know i got one spice right and that could have well been fucking 25 spice. <laughs> i was like oh my god like i was just on fire and of course all the time all the brothers are laughing at me and stuff you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no it's so uh, yeah but, it, but it's a cool experience i think um yeah I, I think whenever we travel to another place we see, get to see ourselves in another way and it i think it, it can be you know enriching in that way. do you have any go-to indian restaurants here in the area you know i i don't i i feel like i need to go to more indian restaurants here. there's gate i think it's gateway to india and tacoma which mm -hmm. is good um and i haven't tried a lot of the other ones so okay yeah do you cook good. indian food yourself I, I think I assemble Indian assemble. food. Like I eat a simplest simple, version. I know what you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like kind of um my mom would it would love to cooking and um would there would be certain dishes that she'd like soak things for days before and you know, just really like enjoy that part of it. I think I I, I enjoy dabbling, but I don't know if I do it as um okay. you know, as properly, you know, it's fine. So next talk about this hashtag that you have everywhere. Hashtag go and do. Mm -hmm. where, where that come from? What's that about? Yeah, um, that's that's the hashtag. I love that. It, I even when I write it, I feel something happens when I even just type it in. Um, but it actually came from a T-shirt a long time ago. There was a T-shirt and it had, um, I remember it had go and do and it had a bicycle. And I think when I when I saw that, it was at the point when I was starting my business and, um, you know, figuring out next steps. And there was something so freeing. That's the only thing that was on the, the only text that was on that t-shirt that was so freeing about like, you sometimes you just need to go and do the thing. Like you can talk about it, you can plan it, 
but ultimately you just have to do it. And I think it's sometimes when I, when I see others doing it, I kind of tag that because it's a reminder that they had the courage to go and do the thing. And even um, for the events and the people that in, I engage with, with um, Innovate Social and Impactathons, I feel like I'm always encouraging them to go and do. Um, and, and I kind of have a, the, the full tagline is like, in all good things go and do. Um, but I feel like, yeah. And I, it's kind of like, that's how yours um, be great. Um, I relate to that too, because there's something just maybe when you write it out in your emails or you tell someone, it probably brings a feeling for you. Yeah, I guess it gave me like a little endorphin rush. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And even for me, I feel like we can be on the sidelines, but sometimes when we kind of muster that courage to just go and do something, it changes not only us, but like everything around us, you know? So. Yeah. That's a good advice. How many people, you know, listen to this or in life in general, like they want to do something, but they're well, I can't do because someone's going to talk about me. My mother yeah. doesn't like it. This yeah. is not the right time, but it's not the right time, right? Like, yeah, go totally. do it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go do it, mess it up, and learn from mistakes. Yes. Better. And sometimes by doing it, the path forms. Like the path won't form when you're, when you're not, when you haven't started. You know, when you do, then you meet the person who says, "Oh, I can do this," or "I can introduce you to this person," or "Or did you think about this?" Or you know. But I think it it takes that first step, and that no one can do for you. Like you yeah. have to just have the courage to like jump or leap or step or whatever that is. Yeah, it reminds me of this. I remember this meme somewhere where somebody said like, "The people who criticize you are always the one you know beneath you, right? It's never like the people who like you want to be someone five years. It's never those people, right? It's always the people that pulling you down. The people above you who already like." You want to be like somewhere in five years. Those people are there who never criticize you. They know how hard it is. Right? Yeah, I'm yeah. like, man, that's pretty good advice right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think, um, yeah, and it's that uh, whole quote about being in the arena, you know? Yes. Um, we, and I, I think, you know, as founders, you are, I am, it is um, all of our successes maybe are based on what we do or don't do. And so are all the criticisms and all of, like, we. there's so many missteps, but there's so many positive steps, but you almost appreciate when you see another founder because you know what it took, even if they're successful, what it probably took to get there, all the quiet yeah. times when nobody was watching and it didn't work, yeah. you know? So I think, um, yeah, I, I really connect to that, that creation energy, what it takes to create. So how do you do that first? Like, you know, like you're going through stuff, stuff stuff's going wrong. You get, you get kicked in the teeth 20,000 times a day. Yeah. People are telling you, no, like how you, how do you like keep the perseverance of using yourself? Yeah. I think a few things. One is maybe having some, um, personal habits that help. Like for me, I love writing, even if no one is reading it. So sometimes when I'm really in a tough thing, trying to figure something out, I'll just write and I'll tell myself, just write until you feel better. Like just write until something makes sense. And it's in my, it's where I also find clarity. Um, another thing is having a like network and trusted people. My sister's an also, also, also an entrepreneur and I have other friends in that space. So it's great. Sometimes when something is cycling in your own head over and over again, that you can kind of pause and talk to someone else who maybe is carries their own, you know, business and, or their own startup kind of idea. Um, and that can help, you know, um, and then I think, you know, spending time in nature, I've been finding that more and more too, or even, I mean, not to get all woo, but they kind of say like seeing water or seeing trees, but I really do feel okay, for something. Me, for me, it's water. Yeah. yeah. I see water. It's like, like an experience, right? I, yeah. I, I see yeah. water. Yes. It's, it's a little bit thing. Yeah. How about you? What do you do? I'm actually curious because you're creating so much content and that's a lift. It's lift yeah, it is. I mean, like I tell people like, it's like smoke and mirrors. Like people in my family think I'm always a millionaire. Like, oh, you all were linked to you. you you're successful. Like, no, nah, not really. You know, like I went to the, we went up to the geek of our event the other day. Like people were like, Hey, you're Jason, right? So like, so it still trips me out, right? I ain't gonna lie. Like I was talking to a friend of mine uh, the other day. She's a, 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 a private equity firm in Gig Harbor. Like, I ain't gonna lie, sometimes I want to quit. You know, I just want to like, just go home quick, drink some bourbon, smoke some dope, watch Rick and Morty, you know? But then it's like, I know I, I could, like two days later, I'm like, okay, let me get back in there, right? You know? Yeah. But it's hard. I mean, it's not easy. It's like, not easy, you know? Like I was, uh, so one thing, like, you know how like people say if they like went up lottery or like become like, start like some successful sale, invest in startups. Mm -hmm. I would, I would with a twist, right? Mm -hmm. I would like invest in startups at 50,000, but I would say I'll pay a hundred thousand not to do your business. Uh, That's going to save you a lot of heartache. Right. Yeah. And I think I'm like, okay. I think a lot of people take that. Right. Cause it's, it, it's yeah. not easy. Right. Not I mean, easy, like, yeah. And no one tell you know, all that stuff's out there, you know, tech crunch this yeah. raise $3 million, you know, yeah. and they don't, they don't tell that stories below, right. The hundreds yeah. of people like, you know, yeah, like totally. grinding out day to day or like, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. I don't know. It's, yeah, it's tough. And there's so much bad advice out there, right? Yeah, yeah. But some people say, you know, do marketing. Some say do product. You know, my yeah. thing is like, do the path that you follow, right? You yeah. might build the product first. You might do marketing first, you yeah. know. You just never know, right? As long as you don't, 
And like, um, my thing is you don't feel an entrepreneur until you quit. You quit, you failed, right? You keep on going some kind of way. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you know, if you've gone, been doing 15 years and you haven't built MVP yet, you might be an indicator that, you know, yeah, not doing the right yeah. thing. Yeah. And I kind of think, you know, with the um, events we do, it's also like our growth as like whatever that is, the founder or the leader. So even if the idea we're working on, it's okay to put it down. Like I, it's okay. Cause maybe in the rest, in the calm, in the quiet, that entrepreneurial spirit will find its own way, whether as an entrepreneur within another company or organization, or maybe a different idea. Um, so I, I like your idea. Uh, I agree. Maybe not quit, like don't ever quit, but mm -hmm. I think don't ever quit the mindset. Mm -hmm. It's okay to put down the thing because sometimes maybe right behind that thing is the thing that will be the right fit, you know? Um, but it's, I think it's that spirit that we bring to it too. Yes. And one thing too, like, you know, we all go to these competitions. Sometimes like, man, there's so much brilliant people out there. Like what chance do I have? Right. <laughs> like, man, they're, they're doing this, they're doing that. They've had this, you know, this much of like, man, I'm here. Like what the fuck am I doing? Mm -hmm. Right. That can be intimidating sometimes, you know, yeah. and then, you know, some, some, someone gives you a compliment and then you go back at it. That's exactly it. Um, the smallest compliment. Yes. And I think probably for you, maybe with the podcast and events and for me with the impactathons, when one person gets something meaningful mm -hmm. out of an event, I get an email or, or they say something. Mm -hmm. I'm like, even though it's been hard, I'm like, I got to get back in the ring. Like, I, that's this is why I'm doing this. Like, yeah. you know, this is why because people get something out of it or else, yeah. you know. We're, we're uh, both go bash you crazy we quit doing this. <laughs> like, I couldn't imagine working on nine to five. I mean, I would have had to, I mean, it'd be, yeah. it'd be horrible. Yeah, yeah. I kind of balance right now. So a few days a week, I'm working in a law office, which is actually really interesting because so much of my career, I haven't practiced law. I've actually done other things with the degree. So it's, it's, I always try to think in a, in a role, including with my own company, am I learning? Am I growing? If I'm not doing either of those, then I don't think I will be there that long. Yeah. So even with the law, there's a lot of that I'm learning still as well. Um, and, you know, and then with the business. So kind of splitting time with that and then working yeah. on Innovate Socials. Yeah. Um, so back to writing real fast. I saw where you used to write, write on Medium. You stopped in 2020. Did you switch somewhere else? Did you go to yeah. Substack or something? Or could I, what, what Medium used to be like, we used to write on Medium. And I could be wrong. I think they started going like, you got to pay to use a service. I think everyone just left it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great, I'm glad. Thanks for reading Medium or looking at that up. Yeah, I, I use kind of Medium more for some of my personal reflections. And those, I will just add it whenever I have them, you know? And so I, I will still kind of use that, but um, sometimes LinkedIn and then Innovate Social blog, I use more for the um, the the work kind of, so those, there have been more, but yeah, I, um, I, I've been kind of working on a novel as well. So I feel like maybe some of my writing, like creative writing has been there, but um, Medium was great. Like I, um, it was, a I, I had a chance to, write a few pieces that had been had been really thinking about a lot like around loss and grief um and you know just reflections um but yeah I mean, that's a good reminder i haven't written something <laughs> there but i that one is my fun one when i really feel inspired okay. or i have this thought you know so I, it's nice it's up there i can always go and add to it but i don't need to prove anything there it's just when i really want to share something you know so with your law degree do you just get a law degree or is it a law degree with a uh, like a like a minor in immigration law or minor in business or just a law degree is a law degree? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's generally just a, a, like it's a law degree, different, you know, you can choose a lot of your electives in the th in your last year. And, and so you can kind of specialize a little bit, you know, but it's uh, most, I don't think a lot of law schools necessarily have a specialization. Some of them do. And some of them, like uh, where I was at, at Chapman Law School, um, because there's a, other schools on campus, some people did a JD MBA. So they did a, a business degree at the at the business school. But um, I don't recall, there may have been a taxation. They had a taxation kind of special. There may have been a specialty, but I think most generally you just get your JD and either through your electives or your work experience, you kind of specialize more. So why did you decide to become it? Because you focus on immigration law, correct? I do. Why choose that path versus all the other laws you could have done? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, well, like I mentioned, I was not active in my law practice or practicing law um, a few years ago. And then um, after some of the things in the news, um, kind of with immigration and the last administration, I just felt like I had, you know, I was licensed in Washington, living in California, but law is federal. It's it's a federal, you know, so if, as long as you're licensed somewhere, you can practice um, immigration law. And so I felt like I'm seeing all of these things in the news and I could be doing something. I could, so there's something maybe I could do. So I started talking to a lot of 
um, immigration attorneys and people in the field. And some of them said, um, if you want to really understand the space, there's like, at that time I was so new to it. So I didn't even know all the different top, like kind of types of immigration law. So I was just like, you know, so, but they were saying, if you, then you should go and volunteer. And just so you understand. So I actually went to the, um, a detention center at the Texas border where there were women and children uh, and spent time there. It was just, it was actually a week that we were there, but we were taking all kinds of asylum cases at different stages. Um, I learned a lot. It was really, um, it was life-changing to hear some of those stories, women looking into your eyes and telling you that they're scared to go back to their country and what they've done. And um, and yeah, and so I, I, I learned a lot there. Uh, then I realized like, for me, I think I think like an entrepreneur. I always think with, with the women that were, that we worked with, I just thought like, I thought nobody's fighting for these women. Nobody, like their country is not, our country is not. And I kind of thought for me, like I left that thinking, I wish we could build like a coding school at the border, <laughs> like let people fight for these women. Like say, we want your skills. We want, you know, um, and so I realized like, I think I kind of came back a little bit like glazed over it. Cause it was just to hear those stories was just really, it was just really tough, you know? And so I thought if I continue in immigration law, I think I would want to support asylum and humanitarian work, but maybe not have it be my full-time role. So um, luckily there was a wonderful um, immigration attorney in San Jose and um, I started working with her and she did more family-based immigration. So people coming in, naturalizing, you know, um, and, um, you know, bringing family members over. And so I kind of learned more at that firm and did some more work there. You know. Yeah. I know with this immigration challenge we have, like people, this is going off like forever, right? It, you know, like, like I think 19, 1910, actually we had the Chinese laws for a while. We wanted Irish people and then Italian people come in like every generation is a new, like anti-immigration law against some set of people, mm -hmm. right? And my thing is, right, of course, bad people come over, right? I mean, just mere numbers, bad people come over, but like, and the people say, oh, they're going to take our jobs. You know, ain't no Americans trying to pick strawberries. You know, ain't no Americans. Like, I worked at a try to seafood when I got the Army. Mm -hmm. And, like, we may have three Americans. The rest of them were Filipino nationals and people from East Africa, like Ethiopia, Somalia, right? Then America aren't doing those jobs, right? But And we need people to do those jobs, you know, mm -hmm. and not doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, it's like, I don't know. And like you said, they're, they're fleeing from something that's bad stuff. But I think it's always been, I think we're in trouble as a country when people don't want to come over, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people are wa walking thousand of miles, you know, with their yeah. kids trying to get over just for a slim chance. I mean, I think it speaks of how good our country is, which is, or maybe it speaks how bad it is over there, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I think immigration, it's a very complex issue, and there, there's talks of immigration reform, but that's such a complex, big thing that needs to happen, and what the immigration laws that were in place have the whole the whole world has changed, you know? So I think it will take a lot of smart people, um, and maybe trial and error to figure out how to, because this is not going to change with climate change and all those climate refugees. There's so many things. And I think migration is going to become a bigger and bigger issue, not just here, but all over the world, you know? Um, and so I feel like it'll be interesting to see how different countries handle it. They use how we leverage technology um, because we don't choose where we're born. None of us do. Um, and so I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what that means. I just put that there. So I just feel like, how do we just create a system that's more equitable? We want to have safe places. We want, I understand that too. Um, but uh, this idea of migration and one day it could be us, something could happen here. We could be trying to leave the U S and maybe we will say, why isn't it easier to go somewhere else? We have to leave because of X, Y, Z natural disaster or something. So I think Jen, right now, this is a good moment that we have to just say, like, maybe we need smart people of multidisciplinary, not just in immigration, outside of immigration, maybe in technology to kind of say, let's all put our heads together and say, how do we create a better system for immigration? Yeah. You know? And it's not the U.S. like, you know, you hear stories all the time, like, like boats filled with how boats supposed to have only have 20 people, have hundreds of people going for like, you know, North Africa to Italy, you know, capsizing, killing everyone, you know. Um, my wife watches this show, which of course makes me watch it too, called us Catch a Smuggler. You know, they try to take drugs from all over. So they did a thing where like, this plane flew from Ethiopia to Brazil, right? And they said, specifically, 50% of those people who come from Africa, like, try to seek asylum, you know? So they're like, doing the passport, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, you know? So it's, it's you know, a worldwide, or I won't say worldwide problem, like worldwide challenge for people, right? Like, yeah. you know, of course, people are saying, like us, go invest in Honduras, El Salvador, you know, all those countries, but, you know, I don't know. It's like, yeah, it's a complex I issue with political effects, historical effects, or ramifications. So, but 
it doesn't, even though it's complex, it doesn't mean that we can't address it. I just think we have to maybe try pilot projects or or try different things and see what can work. And that can be, people can be safer. It can be more equitable. You know, it can, um, you know, also satisfy what people in our country want for, Mm -hmm. to build our country out, you know? So, but yeah, it's, um, it's tough, but it's also, um, we don't realize when you're born in a country that when you're not, it can be a very long journey and you can spend many years not knowing what your future is. You can, yeah. so it's hard to know, how am I going to set up a life? You know, especially if you're here on a work visa, do I set up a life? Do I buy the house? Do I buy the car? Do I, you know, and is it like five years? Is it 10 years? Is it 20? Like, you know, like when will I know? Um, yeah, some so. of these countries, the, the politics are so corrupt, right? It's like, you got to pay money to do this, money to do that. Everyone yeah. gets t- the thing off the top, right? And it's, a, it's a, like a kind of weird, like, like the, the political parties are changing too, right? So people probably don't realize this, but like Ronald Reagan, like one of his last speeches, like real pro-immigration, like yes, he was. we need immigrants to come here all the time. And now Republicans like, are like, no, hell no, build a wall, get them out here, right? But it's probably how the Republican Party, like, like Reagan was like really pro-immigration, you know, pro-American dream. We need these people, people to keep us fresh entrepreneurial, right? So now we're like the Republicans are, of course, like, no, what they're doing now, you know? Mm-hmm. I think so many topics, um are so politicized. So even if like, I remember during um, at the end of COVID when people were, were or weren't wearing masks, you could almost just tell if they're wearing a mask or not, almost, you could almost take a, an idea of where, where their political party like kind of stands lied. And, um, and I think it's, so I feel like sometimes we can oversimplify issues or make them more um, like feel like, like we're more separate and not find the commonality because I think things kind of become very political. And I hope that it's in the middle ground where I think a lot of innovation lies. It's when we can say whether or not I agree with you, we will listen to each other and let's see what are, what do we have in common and what can we build from or innovate from there? You know, Uh, because if we start with what's different, it's very hard, I think, to change someone's mind, like about something major, you know, like, but I think if we can find the areas do we, you know, do we agree on what do we agree on? And then what can we innovate around that, that, that could, you know. And I think people don't realize like the, I don't know the numbers, but the high numbers of entrepreneurs who are immigrants, right? Yes. Like, it's issue. a very high yeah. number, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. like Elon Musk, part of the most famous one right now, came from South Africa. Yeah. And the Google founders. I mean, this uh, immigrants and, and entrepreneurship go together, like yeah. butter and jelly, right? It, and people, totally. people don't realize and that. I think it's kind of like what we were saying, you know, the whole go and do or be great. Like it's almost when you're new somewhere, like when I came, okay, one example is when I was new here, I didn't know where anything was. So if someone's like from Tacoma, come to Seattle, come to Redmond, come to Everett, I'd be like, I would just get in the car and drive. Cause I really, I mean, I, I mean, I could look it up on a map, but I more was new to everything. But as I, now that I've been here a year, I'll be like, do I want to sit in traffic and go X, Y, Z? So I think similarly, when you're new to a place, someone says, oh, start a restaurant. Okay. You know, and then after you've been there, you realize this is hard, like, you know, but I think it's that, it's that energy, whatever energy it took to go to a new country, even, and even say, I'm going to start. It's that same energy that's, that says, okay, now that I'm here, let me also like start something here and start a company or start a business or small business, you know? So I think that is a huge, um, like uh, that, that new mind perspective or the beginner mindset we sh- it something that we can also celebrate and welcome because we're not once you have done it something like that a few times you may not feel as excited about you know <laughs> starting the next thing you know yeah so. i think to me the thing too like when immigrants come over here they have this mindset like america's great let me take every, every, every advantage of every opportunity where most america like yeah i'll do it some other time or I'm only, you're only going to be $20 an hour. I'm not doing that, you know, yeah. or immigrants like more like, no, like motivated, have the drive to succeed. And most Americans, unfortunately, like we take it for granted, you know, yeah, the opportunities here. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's, it's a good energy to connect with. And, and I always think, cause we, you know, and I wonder if you felt like that too, moving around. I feel like that too. When I go into a new place, I feel that energy of like, what, you know, let me try this here. Let me, you know, let me go meet these new people. And I feel like um like that startup feeling. Uh, and so maybe it's not, like, even though you were born in the U.S., I was born in the U.S., we moved so much and we're also founders. I don't know if all of those things are disconnected, you know? Yeah. <laughs> there, might, there might be some connection point between those. So, so I'm putting you on the spot. You, you been putting, let's suppose they put you in charge of all U.S. immigration policy in the United States. What would you do to try to fix this challenge? Um, I think, well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm biased because I, I do these events called impactathons. I would want to do a series of things like events like that or something where we get people from different 
um, who've had different either lived experience in immigration, who have a, even practicing immigration law, who've been at the border, you know, uh, border patrol, all kind of in a room together and say, from our perspectives, what's not, where are the gaps and what are the opportunities? And then kind of let ideas come out of that that could become pilot projects, you know? Because I think no one perspective right now would like, we don't know what we don't know. So I think we need to maybe kind of get folks in a room together that normally wouldn't be in a room together. Like I'm, um, if I practice immigration law, I'm not necessarily running a detention center or working with people at the border at that, you know, in an asylum kind of setting necessarily. So but what happens when we get some of those people, they have so much wisdom based on their roles and their perspectives. And if maybe there, we could, that could be a starting point. Um, and then we kind of cross-reference that with history and politics and things like that, that, that can keep us in mind. Maybe we can actually start creating some policies that make sense. Get some technologists in the room <laughs> too, get some um, folks that can use technology in creative ways. I mean, I feel like that that would be the place that I would start because that's my bias of how I think about solutions. So what do you do right now for the, the law office of Beverly Allen? You recently joined that. What do you do? Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. So I, um, I, uh, the law office of Beverly Allen does uh, family, uh, family law primarily. And then I am doing immigration law there. So doing more family-based immigration. Um, and so how do you, so you just started there working in January, right? Yeah. That, how did that come out? Do you, like, you apply for the job? They reach out to you? No, like, I, um, I was looking um, uh, in, in Tacoma to just see what kind of legal opportunities there were. And luckily, when I talked to them, they're a really progressive law firm. And um, and I feel like they were, we were kind of values aligned. And also, they were really excited about um, opening up maybe a sub practice in immigration law. So it kind of worked out. And I, you know, mentioned to them that I'm also working on my business, Innovate Social, and that combination worked yeah. with them. So and you work there like two or three days a week? Yeah, like Monday through Wednesday. So, how do you do this? How, like, how do you keep them getting too personally involved with the case, right? Because like, I'm sure there's like terrifying, like terrifying, like, they're like heartbreaking stories. Yeah. How do you like keep that like the thin line between personal business like and don't get too involved with a case? Yeah, you know, I think now we're doing a lot of the um the family immigration so family immigration kind of cases. So um so that is something also from my training in my last firm. Like we really have to be aware of all the forms and deadlines and things. So that's our job in 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 the process. So I think as long as we focus on that, you know, um we did clinics and I do some work with um, some volunteer work with Tacoma Pro Bono. Some of those cases are are challenging and tough to hear, but I feel like with some of those, even if we can't help them, I always try to think, how can I get them, get them to someone that can be helpful? So that's, you know, we've, um, there's a great resource for immigration attorneys, AILA, Amer uh, the American Immigration Lawyers Association. So there's a listserv um, an email listserv and people are really collaborative and proactive. So that's been great. So if, if a case comes my way and it's not something that I am like, it's, I don't have experience in that, or it's not something that we handle, I can reach out to someone and say, Hey, is that, is this something that you could support? Or can I give pass your information on to All right. potential client? So this is probably an ignorant question, right? But we're in Seattle, Tacoma, the cross the border, Arizona, Texas, how does the case go from there to all the way up here? Like how's it work? Oh, like between states? Yeah, like how like how do you get a case like? Yeah, well, you know, with, with immigration law, the good thing is it's federal. So it's, we're not looking at state courts. But it, well, I, I guess when I ask, like, if, if a family crosses a border, Browns or Texas, uh -huh. like, how do they get you to be your, their lawyer? Oh. If, if you're all the way up in Seattle, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, they could maybe find it online, find us online, or they might have traveled at this some point to come mm -hmm to okay. Washington state. Um, but, you know, people, you know, can call or they might know someone who's worked with someone that we've worked with, you know, like a referral or something like that. So. And then who's paying for this? Like, I mean, I'm sure you do pro bono, but everything can't be pro bono, right? Yeah. If you're like people donate their money to pay y'all for this, they take care of this stuff. Like, yeah. how does that work? So now that's with asylum law, that's some of those concerns because people are coming with really lean um, resources. So there's some great nonprofits that support some of those cases. Um, now this is more like naturalization, citizenship. A lot of people are working there in a different stage. Um, business immigration law is another area of immigration law too. Um, some companies support some of that as well, but you know. Um, okay. Then how does like a, I think it's called lawyer client confidentiality, but you don't have a client, they're trying to immigrate up here and well, uh, some kind of, you find out they're like, they're actually like a mass murder or a really bad person, right? You then have to tell the police that, or is that covered by client attorney privilege? You turn them in. How does that work? Yeah, you know, I mean, I haven't had a case like that. Um, but if they let us, that there, there is 
client, you know, attorney client privilege to know that, but it may not be a case that we could take. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we wouldn't share that, but that might not be something that we could, you know, um, support. And you might not know this, but what's the average time it takes to like resolve a asylum case? For immigration? Yeah. Um, sure, it depends, right? Yeah, it depends. And right now everything is pretty backed up with mm -hmm. USCIS, so things can take a long time. And so then to, to go into like their case or whatever, like, do we give them a place to live or they have to stay on the board or the tent? Like, how, how do we take care of these people? So that's more asylum law. And that depends if they were in a detention center or, you know, and I don't know all of the, I haven't practiced mm -hmm. much asylum law. We don't know a lot, but there's a great organization called the Northwest Immigration Rights Project. NERP, they are, um, their website probably has a lot of great information and they're doing incredible work um, on the humanitarian immigration side. So, um, we organized an event that was a meet and greet for some of the Im immigration law community in Tacoma. And uh, they were on the panel and they were attending and they're doing um, incredible work. So a little shout out for their work too. If you are an attorney who wants to learn more about immigration law, it's not something you practice, you can um, work with NERP um, and um, support a case and they will mentor you and help you. But um, some people find that, especially if they're not their work is not immigration law at all, find that really um, fulfilling and meaningful. So worth looking into. And do stats show like families are coming together or just guys by themselves, single mothers with their families, they do stats show anything like that? Like what percentage of people coming across? For? From coming from, like, from South America or Mexico. Yeah, like, for like asylum. Yeah, like the, um, the breakdown of the family to come, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, because I just was at a detention center with women and children, that was the focus. I saw the people that I saw was mostly just like, moms or women, daughters, and, you know, and then they're, sometimes they would meet their kids too. And you think that's because all the men like have gotten murdered back in like Honduras or Salvador, um, or maybe the men are like, you know, like. I, I mean, I think so all speak. of the stories are different. I think if they were, by the time we met them with the volunteer work I did, they were already, they had been funneled into a detention center for women and children. So they, maybe they, if they were, they might've been separated from um, their brothers, husbands, you know, or in for some of the women I met, sometimes they they uh, fled after something happened. Um, so you know, so it, it's it's a mixed. It's kind of different. And now I'm not, I'm not sure. There's been a lot of changes with with uh, the Biden administration, so I'm not sure how the even the detention center I was at. I haven't been back in touch to see if if they're running the same way or they're running in a different way now. So the detention center. I know if you listen to what, what news channel you listen to, one is like oh. It's a bed and breakfast, you know, greatest thing ever. Other news channel, like, oh my God, this is like worse than the Holocaust, you know, like, yeah. what was actually truth? Like, how were we having these people live? Like, yeah, was you know, I can only speak to the one that I was in, and we were in a special area. We didn't enter the full detention center, but I will say that the one that we were at, um, uh, I feel like the um the the clients that we worked with were treated pretty well, and they were there was um materials for the kids like to color and do things. I was grateful that that they had like, you know, clean clothes and they, they seem to be, and, and seem to be um, eating well and all of that. So I can't speak to all the other yeah. ones and kind of what's happening, but that was the one that we saw. And um, that's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So another ignorant question, do Canadians immigrate to the United States? Yeah, they can. They <laughs> it's because, uh, you know, they, uh, with some of, with some countries, there are, um, different um, agreements between the countries. So it creates different um, immigration pathways. So each country has like a different quota we put on them, right? Uh, some co countries have quotas. Yeah. And that's why there can be um, long wait wait times for countries that have, um, you know, exceeded that or are kind of on that. Um, and then there's different um, visas for um, like between Canada and like Australia. Sometimes it's a more expedited process, just like how it is for US for some countries. Um, it's an expedited visa process. Okay, nice. Uh, next, so on February 23rd, February 2023, did an article on LinkedIn called What We Learned About Listening Pitches. I don't know if you remember that or not, but can you talk about that? Um, the article you did on LinkedIn called uh, What We Learned About Listening Pitches. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So. I think, um, so these events that we do through my company called Innovate Social, we do these events called Impactathons. And so um, people get together and they don't have to have an idea. They come, they they identify issues they see in their community or that they want to solve. They We do some workshops on like what social entrepreneurship is, you know, how to um, 
you know, um, uh, how to map a problem. So you're trying to solve the root cause and not a symptom um, and uh, how, what would be in a pitch. And then they work on their ideas and they pitch. So through that, I've seen hundreds of pitches and I also sometimes um, judge pitch competition. So I think what I've learned is we learn a lot that kind of unexpected things from pitches. And one is that we get to see what people identified as an issue in their community or with their peer group. And I think it's it's a listening opportunity. You and know? these people that like certain age group, just like all of the places. It really right? depends on the partner. We always do with the partners. So okay. sometimes if it's with the university, sometimes it's maybe for that university setting or their alumni. Sometimes it's open to the general public. We did one in Tacoma that was open to the public. Majority of folks were probably from Tacoma, but there were people that drove out. Um, we've done some online that kind of opens it up. So um, yeah, so I think that when we have a chance to listen to pitches, we also get a chance to hear people identify things that they want to change. And I think what's been really interesting is as I've done these at universities, over time, I would say now, every year, I'm seeing at least one or two solutions around mental health, which I wasn't seeing maybe seven or eight years ago. So I think it's a chance for us to say, what what are people struggling with? What what is not being addressed? And I think that's a good thing. We should listen. And how often do you do these pitches? Um, well, the, uh, the Impactathon. Yeah, yeah Impactathon, is, it's it's based on, um, we do it with partners. So we've done 23 of them across the United States. Um, we were going to do our first international one and then COVID happened. So it'll be, um, hopefully it'll be happen in the future. But um, but yeah, like, you know, I think um, we, it's, it's, it's just depends on, on the, on the flow of when, when that kind of comes together, but we have our next one happening in November, early November, first week of November in Southern California. Okay. Yes. And so you have like varied interests, right? Um, of course, I can't, I can't cover all now, but animal welfare, children, civil rights, economic empowerment, education, environment, human rights, disaster, humanitarian relief, and science technology, right? Do you actually like get involved in those things or does these things just like to get involved with? Like if you do, if you are, if you are like involved in all those, how do you, how, yeah, how, yeah. how, how do you do that? Those are my interests. Maybe interests. they all connect to social impact. Yeah. And what's great is sometimes through the work I do through Innovate Social, I, even if I'm not working on it, I can amplify or connect mm -hmm. people who are interested in that. So by listing some of those, it lets people say, Hey, like, I'm working on X, Y, Z. Do you know someone who's doing something like that? And if, if I do, I can, you know, connect them. Or if they have an idea that they're trying to launch in that, I can try to support them. In um, If you had to pick launch. one to focus on forever, which one would it be? Oh, my goodness. Um, can you see the list of them? Uh, well, let's, I'll just think through. Um, yeah, I, I think, I don't know if I could choose one. I think it's really the... The meta level, the like, ecosystem it's like, it's building. Like your favorite kid, you yeah. <laughs> I think it's. I think really, it's the ecosystem building around those. So, I would love to be able to support an ecosystem um, where though any of those ideas could find a pathway to be successful and create impact. So, if if I can spend my time in like connecting, being a super connector, I think you are that person too that we connect others or like what you're doing now by you doing this podcast, you amplify the, literally amplify the voice of others. So I feel like even for me, that's sometimes the place that I feel comfortable is supporting that interstitial fluid yes. that lets others also shine and grow. Yeah. So speaking of ecosystems, how have you built a great ecosystem or what's some tips you give for people who want to build an ecosystem on their own? Yeah. Yeah. I think with ecosystem building, um, a lot of it is kind of putting yourself out as a connector and also finding, um, you know, I, I feel like rather than seeing others in your sphere as being competition, kind of finding that place of collaboration where we amplify each other's work. And um, if someone's doing the same thing I'm doing and they're successful, for me, I'm like, great, that means it can be done. They're successful. That means other people can succeed, succeed in that. So I think that's one thing. I think also trying to identify who are the different players and and what they're doing in the ecosystem. So if like when I start, first started my work, I was really focused on the social entrepreneur, the person with the idea. Um, and as I kind of progressed, I realized you can have amazing social entrepreneurs and they are there, but if we don't have the ecosystem to support them, they might get to a stage where they either need funding um, to grow or they need to literally shut down. And I've seen that where people have had to shut down great ideas so i think that's when i realized that's not a social entrepreneur problem <laughs> that's an ecosystem opportunity yeah. you know where we need to build better ecosystems so 
So from your point of view, what makes a good ecosystem versus a bad ecosystem? Yeah, like I love looking into nature, kind of seeing as as an as a guide. So I love when some of the hikes I go, they have a canopy, they have that that top layer of um of of um foliage that protects the um that lets the saplings and the smallest uh, seeds grow with some protection from the elements. They have you know. Um, uh, different kinds of plants that are growing different ways, some that are growing up, some that are kind of hanging down. Um, they have different stages. Some plants are dying and some are starting and they can actually get the nutrients from all of those. Some are ending, some are beginning. And similarly, I think in the ecosystem for entrepreneurship, we need that too. The advisors and the, um, the folks that have a lot of experience can support and kind of protect the newest ideas that are kind of emerging. Uh, we have the funders who can provide fuel and, um, and, you know, a pathway for some of these ideas that are growing, you know, um, we have the um, pollinators. And I think that's where I feel like you and I, and me and so many of the other organizations that I work with that are that don't just stay in one place like a tree. They actually are like the bees or the they you know the the butterflies that actually move from one thing to another and, and cross pollinate ideas and connect each other. Um, so I think we kind of need all of those things, you know, to to be successful. So like in Seattle, there's some kind of networking event every day. All the stuff in Tacoma, and there's all these like you know, Founders Live, Startup Grind, Startup Two Five Three, uh, Newton Tech Northwest. You go on and on and on, right? How do you personally like utilize your time the best, like like to know which one to go to? You know, because obviously you, can't, you shouldn't go all of them, right? You have to build a business. Like, how do you balance that out? Yeah. I, I, and I want to hear your answer to this too, actually, because I'm curious. I think it goes through waves. Sometimes I'm in a in a point where I realize I need some external. Um, motivation and for me going to an event networking that will get those juices kind of flowing talking to people and sometimes if I'm getting deep into some work I almost need to kind of get really deep and quiet and I that will be a distraction then I'll go to somewhere and, and whatever focus I'm trying I'm trying to to form it'll get kind of um, diluted, you know? So I think I just have to kind of, I'm better. I don't know if I'm always very good at this, but trying to just observe where I am in, in the projects that I'm working on and just kind of also be more like give more grace to ourselves I think so so to say that sometimes you feel like you should I think should energy is really is can be really tough and can be kind of detrimental should energy kind of says I should because I should and, and that leaves us feeling I don't know kind of empty or that we're always failing so instead I kind of think like is this the right time to go and connect with others or maybe it's better that I even if I didn't do anything but I just needed that quiet time to kind of and this summer has been a good example of that I feel like um, we were going to meet earlier this summer. And then I realized I was not quite in that mode. I needed to kind of dive into a few things more deeply. And I was like, maybe if Jason doesn't mind, I'll push this to the end of summer when, and it kind of has worked out. Now I feel like I'm, it's coming back into more of that connecting, going to events, you know, um, some of that energy is there. And so it's, it's a good energy, but I want to actually ask you that too. Yeah. So I feel like we also, I wonder if you identify as an extrovert, introvert. I feel like I have elements of both, but, and how that also impacts how you decide yeah. to go to things. So honestly, I sucked at it first, right? I was like, oh, there's a network thing going on. I got to go to, there might be a customer for you. I might need, or I might meet somebody who wants me there, right? Like, it's how to backtrack from that. So me, I'm actually an INF, INFJ, right? But I suppose that one percent of us, right? So I'm an introvert, introvert, right? Like, I'll say this, I said this on the podcast. Like, whenever I do like a podcast or even the pitch conference we did, right? Everything I'm supposed to do, like, when I have public speak, about ten or twenty minutes before that, I'm like, I, I think of my ways to get out of it, right. Wow. Like, you know, at the, the pitch conference, man, maybe I just leave, or maybe <laughs> if I, maybe I pick learning jobs, you know. Mm. And of course, I do it because okay, like, yeah, looks right, yeah. But it's yeah, I, I used to suck that before. Right now, it's yeah. like. Now I like, stop doing a lot unless someone asks me to go, right? Okay. Or like just some like really value I can add or mm -hmm. do something. Before I was like going to everything, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's like, and plus me, like I get drained yeah. doing that stuff, right? Yeah. But it's, it's a good mix, right? Yeah, I, I got it all wrong yeah. at first, right? I will say though, like, so knowing that you're an introvert, introvert, um, and maybe that's why this form, does this feel comfortable? Yeah, when I you're talking? You can go. I and um, I will say for anyone that wasn't at, one of has been one of your events your production quality is one of the highest i've Thanks. seen even at the pitch so maybe that's maybe that gives you like a focused way yeah. to kind of show up at that event or, or maybe because of all my you know perceived inaccuracies by having all tech covered up for you now. no no <laughs> but even um it's you know well, you know even in podcasting when i was podcasting more the sound quality is like the, you're 
that's the king. Like yeah, that's the that's king, the, yeah. you're always trying to get good sound. Yeah, all the video, not that even all the video, but but even for you, even the video is great. Not so. I, I think the production value is the thing that will set you apart. And if yeah. that if that if that is your way to feel like you have the control or like maybe that's the excellence that you'll bring to this that you that you are bringing yeah. to the space Thanks. is through production quality. That's really important. And not this is not easy. I wish everyone could see <laughs> all of the <laughs> gadgets and uh, just, have all and all of the cameras the. The light that's here, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it takes a lot of thoughtful planning yeah. to make all that happen. So I think that's, that's a credit you. to you. Thank you. Um, so next, let's talk about Tacoma Maritime Innovation Incubator. Shout out to Karina. Shout out Karina. <laughs> so obviously you're not a water-based startup. I'm not, yes. How did that, how yeah, did that, yeah. How did you that know, um, I am so grateful that I crossed paths with Karina and Josh and Joshua um, because they, and along with Startup 253, Stan and some other folks, really were my welcome into Tacoma and into the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I, I sometimes think if that first event, I hadn't been w- met with the warmth of, of some of these folks, I may not have done some of this here. You know, it just it may have said, okay, they seem to have their own thing. I don't, there's nothing I can contribute here. But um, since day one, it's been such a welcoming place and um, and Karina runs the Tacoma Maritime Incubation, um, Innovation Incubator. And, um, you know, through events, I met with her. And once we had coffee, and I explained to her, one of the new projects that we're working on is a children's book series that introduces a problem solving mindset to young learners. And I thought I was kind of showing her that as maybe I could support the incubator by teaching about social entrepreneurship. One thing about Karina, I don't care how far it is from water. So you're going to find a way to connect (laughs) you and try to convince you to it'll fly with the incubator. I love you could it. Be, you could be like, you know, planting roses in a desert in Arizona and she'll find a way to link it yeah. to water. And she, and that not only will she find it, she will see it in her mind and she will make you believe it too. Like, she, like you will see that too. Cause um, you know, I, it's, it's so, so, so anyway, so I, I, I showed her the books and I had them on my computer that the, that draft, the whole draft has changed. We have a new illustrator, but, um, and the second book looks at, pollution in the waterways. It's just one of the topics in that. And she said, okay, that's a really important. And we want young people to be thinking about the water in that way. So I said, I don't know, Karina, this is a very tenuous connection. <laughs> but then the kind of good thing is the vision I had was impacted on as a model. I was hoping could uh, connect more people to maritime based issues. And we did an impact a thon. And that was, that was something that happened there. So even though the impact on as a model is agnostic, it doesn't have to be maritime. It, it could be in our one of our speakers was a port commissioner. And so some of the ideas were related to, you know, maritime. So I think for me, that's the thing I hope. I, I always like to think, how can you leave something better than when you started? So I hope after my time in the incubator, I have created or can support pathways that will allow others a pathway into the maritime space, you know. Um and this is a your program. Uh, the cohort. I, I'm I'm in in the cohort. It's, it's a year program. How long is it? Oh, it's a, it's a year program. Yeah, okay. it's about a year. Yeah, I think we will. We started in the fall, and then we'll do our final pitches in the fall. So it's a year. And so, what have you gotten out of it? I think the biggest thing is the people. I always think, you know, um, our cohort's great. We're fr- like, you know, we we can like lean on each other or talk to each other, um, and that's been really great. Um, Karina's wonderful, and I think that um, they've helped. It's been when you're new somewhere, it's really been a nice introduction to the rest of the ecosystem. Um, so, and then there's office space um, and there's support. Like, if there's anything you really needed and you could tell Karina or tell Joshua, they would kind of put their minds together and think, how can we get you in front of those people or get you that resource? So, I think that's great. And even if it doesn't work out necessarily in um, in that way, I think there's so much growth that happens through that conversation or um, through the meetings that it may give us a better idea of what's the actual need because if if the need that we thought wasn't the need maybe there's another you know um another thing that we can create or or um the office space is like an actual office is like a hot desk it's um you know the um it's like a hot desk but there's a a dedicated area in the center for urban waters which is a beautiful building yeah Yeah. and that's where the pitch event that you hosted was so co-hosted yes and nice and how often do y'all meet like like, do weekly meetings monthly meetings uh we we um are, it's good to be in the office a couple of times a week. Um, and then there's events, you know, going on and there's some programming that, um, that Karina really organizes like talks and things like that. So I would say we probably have 
we're everyone's on kind of asynchronistic schedules. Mm-hmm. So everyone's going to the office doing, and their businesses are different. And some people are traveling or for me, I often have meetings, so I'm not, you know, but um, I, yeah, I would say that we're um, probably once a few times a month, we're meeting together, maybe, you know. Um, and how does Karina or whoever it is, how do they track you? I can make that good progress and making sure space. Yeah. How you know, we do a lot of that? one-on-one meetings with Karina and try to send her updates. Um, and, you know, luckily if you're going to like, you know, I was at the event that you were at, so I got to catch up with her a little bit there. Or we, Karina and I went to an event in um, Seattle as part of Seattle Tech Week, so kind of catch up with her there. Um, so yeah, just kind of that one-on-one, um, you know, giving the updates and the snapshot of where we are. And I think the big thing is we'll have a pitch um, in fall where we have to kind of update everyone on our progress and what the year has been. So that'll be a nice. big deal too. Next, you wrote a book, I believe, called 51 Questions on Social Entrepreneurship. Can you talk about that? Yes. And I I was going to bring one. I, I was going to bring one for you. So I forgot, but it's um, I'll bring it next time I see you. But yeah, so that book um, really came out of when I was trying to learn about the social entre- entrepreneurship space, that was something that I felt really connected to, this idea of using business to create impact. But I was realizing I was going to one talk to hear about legal structures, one talk to hear about business models, one talk to hear about measuring impact. Um, And really for an entrepreneur, all of those things are kind of on the same plane. We're making a lot of those decisions together. You know, the business model is might be connected to our legal structure. You know, it's, they're all connected. So I felt like I, at that time, back in, you know, um, I think the book book published at the end of 2015, I was, I wasn't finding a lot of resources that put all of those things in one place. So I thought maybe I should write a book, you know? Um, And so I wrote a book. It's a, there's a storyline. So there's three characters and they meet at an event called Impactathon. At that time, little fact, there was no event called Impactathon. Later the event came and I thought, what should I call it? And I was like, oh, it was in the book, it's called Impactathon, but that's how it started. But um, so they meet and they work on a, um, a, a solution to address food deserts in, in, in the book. But in that process, they ask 51 questions kind of related to social entrepreneurship. So it's written in a way that if you just want the questions and answers, and you don't want to read the story, you can just read those. Um, You know, we're talking about certifications around social impact, um, different legal structures, all those things. Or if you want to read the whole thing as a story, you can read it that way. So So why do it through Amazon versus like a book publisher? Yeah, you know, I was so new. um, And it's funny, because I'm doing the next books also um, independently published, but I was so new to all this that I didn't really know the process and I kind of had this urgency that I wanted the book to be out and just like all of this in this room you have control over it with this the independent publishing or self-publishing process you have a lot of control over all of the stages of the publishing process Um, everything from the design to the published date to all of that so I think maybe I was like I'll just get it out and then maybe I'll figure it out from there. It's almost you know? like a, a almost like an MVP for your book. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like a go and do thing. Like I can wait, but I just don't know enough to know what I don't know. Maybe I'll just get it out there, you know. So can you tell us about your writing process? Yeah. Um, the writing process, um, I it started actually as a um the idea started with a co-author, and then that it didn't quite work out. And so I had to start kind of over on that book process. Um, but really with that, I looked because my my company, Innovate Social, started as a blog. And so I actually did some data and metrics on what blog posts, how many, you know, how they were used, how they how much time people spent on them as a starting point of, of coming up with questions. And in some ways, by calling it 51 questions, it um, I must have decided that maybe early in the process, it kind of created both a goal, like I had to get to 51 questions, I couldn't have 48 questions in the book. But I also had to choose the 51 best questions. So there were questions that if they didn't fit, then I had to choose a better question, you know. Um, so I think it kind of it created some, uh, they say, there's this great quote that says, um, design thrives with constraint. So it created some constraints that actually helped me write the book. You know, otherwise I think it would have been so open sesame. I may never, I may still be open. It may not have published even now, you know? And what was your intended audience for this book? Yeah. I, I really thought about any, anyone that's thinking of how to use business to create social impact. So whether it's an entrepreneur uh, who is launching something, whether it's a student who's like thinking, what do I want to study and what do I, I want to create impact? But really, I think the, the probably through line is the impact because there's many business books that are probably way more famous, you know, um, but combining that idea that I, I want to create social impact, but I want to think about business as well. So I know on, on your book, it's like every author in you know, Amazon says this, you know, Jason Kavanagh's best-selling book, right? 
I mean, all of them can be best on a book, right? Or best on an author. Like, how's that? Yeah. Where does so, that come um, from? I I researched this a lot because I didn't ever want to say something that wasn't true. Um, they're in to be an Amazon bestseller, it's its own definition, and so it, it means that you're trending number one over some amount of time. And there's really no like okay. you could take a screenshot of it. Like I think that's what, we, and then that that will then you're it's it's okay like that's what an amazon bestseller is um new york times bestseller has an all of those it's yeah. very way different um but that is what an amazon bestseller is. i'm like man everyone can't be like amazon bestseller but, but you kind of you kind of can because can't if be okay. you you if you choose a category and maybe you have all of your friends and family who are going to buy that book or whatever and just say can you buy it at this time or at this and then as long as it's trending number one or within the top three, but I think it's number one. Okay. Then you know, uh, then then you then you're an Amazon bestseller. Okay. So an Amazon bestseller is not necessarily that it's always an Amazon yeah. bestseller, just like with any other. Maybe like one one minute you was on top of the list. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So so for some amount of time you were a number one. So so what is a self entrepreneur? I why should anyone care about self entrepreneurship? Yeah. Uh, so um, a social entrepreneur, I really think, is someone who uses business models to create social impact, and a lot of times. Um, you know, when you look at a business and a founding team, because it's it's a term of art in the United States. No one is um, regulating it. It's not like a, in some countries, it's actually a term you have to register with the with the government. So it's actually like this, you know, there's a formalization to it. But in the U.S., it's a term of art. We use it. But what I always look to is where, like, is the profit and impact motive, are they both equal and are they both like the top motives? You know, so if Profit motive is number one and impact is like, all right, cool. When we get to it, that to me is not what a social enterprise is. It's like we we started this to create impact and to create profit. So it doesn't mean that impact needs to be like number one, but it has to be equal to, to profit in my mind. That That's my my view of it. So I think um, that's why, you know, when, when I first was in some of this, getting into some of this work, Uber and Lyft were just starting to, you know, and there were so many positives about Uber and Lyft, you know, you're not using your own car, you're saving on gas. And people are like, are these social enterprises? But I said, I don't, these are, they're, the impact is there, but it's not the primary thing or, or it's not equal to profit. So I think that those are businesses that could be having social impact maybe with their, I don't know, I'm not even sure actually if they are with their, you know, um, uh, footprint around the uh, environment, but it's more like companies that are founded with that as their core principle, their kind of their operating principles is impact and profit. Have you used, have you used Uber recently? No. Those prices are ridiculous, right? Yeah. Back in the day, you could like buy ten dollars worth. Like a couple of weeks ago, I was, I was supposed to go to South Lake Union for something, right? I could do the Uber like fifty five dollars. Oh. Like I I'll, like I'll fucking walk. Yeah. Like, this, yeah. This is crazy. It's crazy. Fifty five dollars. Yeah. Like what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think a lot of those. Um, uh, it's changed. And at the beginning, they were prof- uh, operating at a loss. So, you know, like they I mean, were just trying they to, to raise their price. They raised my man, $55. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know, right? it's crazy. Yeah. It's- so can a social impact be on both sides of the of an issue? Like, for example, like I'm making this up, of course, it, generalizations. Can there be a social impact nonprofit for our people like like believe, like or, I'll say uh, anti-gun, right? We'll get rid of guns. And the other one, the other side was like they're pro-guns, right? Can mm-hmm. social impact be on mm-hmm. both sides? Mm-hmm. I guess maybe with this, I um, my view of so- social impact is inclusive and progressive, and things that are um, not bringing some people up to put some other people. I mean, down. people want everyone have guns, right? That's inclusive, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. That's not. Yeah, so I mean, yes, I guess maybe probably there is a bias in uh-huh. my in my um, view of social impact, but I I think you know promoting things like more you know peace and inclusive inclusivity those are things that are really important to me equity so diversity, let's suppose there's a, something out there you believe in but there's like two sides of the issue like how would you decide what side it yeah you know i would like to talk to both sides i would like to understand um i would like to see are is there data points on how we're helping or harming guns um also create a lot of harm and it when in the wrong hands um you know so it's it's a tough you know the, those are like you know and it's not yeah so this is a it's it's a good topic to consider and you know and in reality if we're ecosystem builders we have there has to be space for someone to bring that perspective up i do believe that there so at an impactathon if someone had that view i hope we could like you know like that they could um voice it but i 
I think that's not aligned with some of our core values of what Innovate Social is. Yeah, you not know? on our PP, like, you know, people believe what they believe, and someone has a different viewpoint, they like shut them out. They want like, at least listen to their viewpoint. You're not going to agree with it, at least let them, you know, yeah. hear it. And so many yeah. people are like, this is my side, this is what I believe in, and, you know, you know, red is the best color ever. You know, I don't care. We, I don't care what kind of proof we have. The blue is the better color. I'm not going to listen to you, right? I think that's probably on both sides, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think so. And um, yeah. So, so I saw this in my notes. What, what is this? Um, so it says you are certified in the emerging field of conscious contracts. Yeah. What is that? So yeah, it's great. Um, uh, Kim Wright is the founder, one of the co-founders, and um, uh, around, around conscious contracts, and it's this area of emerging area of collaborate collaborative law that um, says, how could we design contracts with the idea that there could be, um, like something may come up that that will make something not work. Like it, from the beginning, how do we look at that? So how do we look at the values? Like if you and I were going to get into a contract around some entrepreneurship kind of initiative, right? We would maybe in this process, we might first start and say, what are our core values? Um, and how do we show up when when there is something that doesn't feel right? So maybe, Jason, you say, um, you know what? When something doesn't feel right, I go quiet. That's when I I won't answer an email. I won't answer a call. I that's that that's the way I handle things. And maybe I'll say, I'll want to talk about it. I want us to like get into a room and figure it out. So how can we write an agreement saying if something um if something doesn't feel right, we can send a signal to each other, maybe like um, I don't know, you know. You, you, you leave the blinds down or some, okay. something like very subtle. And that maybe starts our process. Now we, and what we do before is we come up with the process. When this happens, how can we already figure out the process that we'll do? Okay, if this happens, we're going to have a 15 minute coffee, you know, at, at, the, at the local coffee shop. And we're going to mention three things that like don't, don't feel right, you know, but we almost, we kind of spell it out. And then we might say, we'll go and read our contract again. So we know, you know, and then maybe we'll say, um, like, how will we kind of work through this? And if none of that works, then we can go through more, um, you know, uh, arbitration or anything like that. But if we know that if we, if we're coming into something with good intentions to work together, to create something together, there's a chance that something may, we might have a blip along the way. So rather than have it go atomic at that time and and, and have just things totally, let's go back to when we were of a calm mind, we came up with this agreement, we came up with this process, and then we can trust that when our mind is not calm and when we, when we are kind of agitated and we can say, I mean, maybe there's a way to work through that. So especially for founders, this happens a lot where founders go in with, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, so excited. We're going to do this together forever. And something can happen in that process. It's like a marriage, right? Like it's something can happen. It can break those founders apart. And it can be so devastating that it can actually shut down the company, right? But if we start with this idea that things can happen, things happen all the time. And if we just find a process to get through it, then maybe we can come through that connected to our core values and still emerge with the thing that we were trying to do. So when you deal with someone, they become on your hands. What do you do to calm them down, like personally? Like within the conscious contracts yeah. side, maybe it's to look back at what they decided with us in a calm mind. So we can say, you know, like I, um, as part of the, the certification, I had to have a client, and they were like five, I think five co-founders, and it was interesting because there was two that were new and three that had been working on this idea for longer. So they were kind of merging. So for them, they, they came up with this thing like, okay, we have to um, um, kind of raise it to one person in, in the group. I can't remember exactly what, what they said. And then they have to raise it to the, to the kind of mention it in the group. I think they wanted to maybe spend time looking at their, um, the original agreement again. And then their whole thing was like, how will we know that we've resolved it? That's another thing you ask. They said, when we can go out to churros together, <laughs> then we know that we've resolved it. And if, and if you didn't go out to churros, that means you're not yeah. resolved, you know? So sometimes it's, it's a funny thing. Like you think we can just talk about it, but when something happens, like some of our normal um, communication changes yeah, too, yeah. you know, so. So as a lawyer, do you have to like, take some kind of test to keep updated all the legal things going on? Or once you're a lawyer and pass the bar, that's all you got to do? Then you have to do the continuing legal education, CLEs. And with every state, you might have different requirements of how many CLEs you have to do um, and submit that 
on a regular basis to show, you know. Let's suppose like you just blow it off one year, you miss it all. You have to do the whole law process all over again. Oh, that's a good question. Um, If you miss it for a year, it's a chance that maybe it's every two years. Mm -hmm. And then if you do, if you do not, you can put your, um, uh, your bar status in kind of a hibernation mode. So then you're like, then there's so many years it can be in that. And then if you come, if you decide to practice again, then you often have to catch up on your CLEs. Um, if you totally do nothing for a certain number of years, you, I don't know, maybe you have to take the retake the bar exam. Um, but I think most people like the, the bar, the state bar will probably be in touch with you. So you know what, you know, what's happening. But let's suppose you're a criminal lawyer in the state of Washington, right? You pass all the bars that were Washington. Can you know, go to like go to Colorado and be like a guest lawyer somewhere, or you have to pass that bar exam? Oh, that's a good question. Um, if you're like, you can be co-counseled in, so maybe that's an agreement where there's already an attorney from that other state that's there too, but you're kind of co-counseling. Maybe there's an issue that has some Washington law and some. Uh, oh, did you say Colorado? Yeah, Colorado law. Um, if um, if you're corporate counsel, that you can often be. Um, just have one state's bar license. You don't necessarily need to have it from the state. That's if you're like, you know, company counsel or corporate counsel. Um, if you're doing working on federal issues like immigration or trademark, that you just need to be barred in one state, and but you can practice in another state. Okay. Uh, so next, let's talk about impact the thought again, right? Can you do it like a deeper dive? Like you've been in 20 different places doing Southern California. Like how do you like, it's a question all, all over the place. Like how do you decide where to do it at? How do you decide who's going to pitch? Like all those details. And yeah. who's, who's helping out with this? Yeah, yeah. Um, great questions. Um, and so with Impactathons, we work with like local partners, like I mentioned, universities and schools, companies. Um, and then we kind of design based on how will it, be useful for the participants. I always think everything is designed for the participant because they're the main event at Impactathon. They're the ones that are creating the ideas. So we think what tools can we put in their tool belt? We have the impact talks. These are short 10 minute talks, usually um, by different um, perspectives in that community or around that topic. Um, there'll be uh, you know, workshops. Sometimes I lead the workshop. Sometimes our co-partner they they might want to lead or we we find the right person to lead like one on what is social entrepreneurship one on problem mapping are we solving the root cause of a problem or a symptom one on um like what's going to be in your pitch um and then they work and it and then these events are one to three days so then the teams just work together we often bring in impact catalysts who are like mentors to hear their pitches and get give them feedback and then the judges at the end and then what I'm also trying to do or we're trying to do is bring in ecosystem partners so that once they finish this impactathon uh, experience with uh, an, a pitch, a team, um, and, you know, an idea they want to work on, they can take that to an incubator or take that to another competition or, you know, keep working on that. And so you're a judge of the pitches too, right? And I actually now try not to judge not the pitches okay. because I'm like in the press. I'm okay. like in, I'm doing the event. I'm facilitating okay, the event. Yeah, so. yeah. so when you like listen to these pitches and you said they're 10 minute pitches? Uh, they're usually three to four minute pitches. So how long into the pitch do you click your band? This person has something or vice versa, man. I don't know about this person's idea, right? Yeah. How long does it take for that? Yeah, so that's a that. great question. I think it can happen. Sometimes you can have an aha moment where things tie up at the end and it all makes sense but often I think in the first 30 seconds you can kind of see because it's also like you are a veteran right so if let's say you heard an an idea based on something you had experienced during your time maybe I wouldn't have that life experience so maybe for you that idea would resonate more so similarly every judge is different or every listener is different so some things may just resonate more um but uh, but I think oftentimes with their energy or with their, you know, you kind of get an idea in the first few seconds, kind of like, okay, this is something interesting. So any tips for people getting ready to pitch of how to approach the, the process? Yeah, you know, I think um, being really clear at the beginning of the problem that you're solving and the solution that you're offering, quantifying or somehow giving an idea of how big that problem is, those are all really good things to start your pitch off with. And then of course, being passionate and being like reminding us in the audience that you are exactly the right person that should be pitching this solution and working on this idea. That is, that's like kind of incalculable. Like you, that's just the energy that you have, but you, we should leave the pitch feeling like that's the person and that's the thing that should be working on, you know? So the best pitch I ever heard so far, like there's a, a school called Technology Access something, right? It's, it's called TAF. It's in Fredo Way. 
like a STEM school for like six o'clock, right? And I was just a pitch culture, right? As an eighth grader, right? Three eighth graders got up. One guy got up and he said, my, my, my phone's at zero, 1%. Now it's fully charged. He wanted how he had a plan, like using human electricity to charge a phone, right? Mm -hmm. And I, everyone that's looked at, oh my God, here's a billion dollar idea, right? Yeah. So yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And that probably just captured everyone. Yeah, whatever, yeah. Just like, turn up. What, what did you say? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you. We've been talking for a while and you, I can tell you've done a lot of research for this. Like you looked at media, no <laughs> one needs my medium articles. That's great. All of those things. So um, at this stage of the interview, because I, I, I do this because I also love podcasting. Yeah. Are you feeling like, like kind of exhausted because you're like trying to keep all these threads together i mean my, my mind is racing like, racing, like yeah. i have a set of talking points and you just say stuff and i talk of this you know and then like you'll talk some more i don't want to be rude and interrupt i'll talk over you right you're like stop and, that's and gonna then, come and later then it, it disappears and it comes back you know yeah it's all yeah, yeah. It's so right now you're probably after this you're gonna feel a little exhausted mentally because it's like a lot of ping-ponging yeah. yeah. i mean we're balanced I, I feel like um uplifting you no know, because i was yeah. like getting motivated talking people actually doing good things yeah like, yeah that's cool no, i just i was wondering because yeah you've done a lot of research that's impressive yeah, and you've done twenty three impact so yeah. far. Yeah, you do like a once a year, once. Uh, six like months. a few a year, and I really want to get to fifty. I think from I don't know why that's been a magic number for me for a while, but like I want to get to fifty, and then I think through that we can decide what do we want to do. Is there some technology piece around this that can help scale this, or kind of like do we know what could be like an impactathon in a box where mm -hmm. we can give right. people the yeah. parts and they can do it themselves? But I feel like every market, every group is so different that I don't want to make any assumptions yet. And because the Bay Area was one kind of um, experience and then here, sorry, um, then and then here, and people do or don't always know about what a hackathon is and all that. So I feel like there's still a lot of learning and also to get out of the country too and do some of these, you know. How do you pick the location? So we kind of just, we kind of look at our partner and see what will be good. Um, we had a chance to do one in Baton Rouge and uh, we worked with Eric Reed, who's an NFL player. And he wanted to take one to, uh, he wanted to introduce um, high school students in the city that he grew up in um, to introduce them to social entrepreneurship as a career path. And so, do your partners pay for this? Or you, you, so there's a program fee yeah. for this. And that's, that's our business model. At the beginning, um, I looked into, we looked into doing it like um, passing the cost on to the participant, mm. but that, I don't think that was the win-win-win. Yeah, win, win, yeah you know? I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I think this was almost, it can be a win for the partner because they hopefully want some of this, these new ideas, this in, influx of innovation, and and they would feel comfortable that we've done enough that they know we'll get to the finish line, you know? And the people pitch, they have to be involved with social impact some kind of way, or can oh, just be that's a... kind of been a focus of ours. And I feel like you can find, there's many ways to define that, um, you know? So I feel like we can find maybe the impact in it. So that's you put your Karina hat on and make, make, yeah. make these long-term, you know, yeah. connections yeah. that yeah. might not exist if exactly. you don't know a person. Also, some people, when, once they go through the workshops, they're like, oh, I didn't ever, I didn't know that I could think of a business model that had built in impact. So, you know, that's why I kind of say, just come. If you, if you are ready to have the experience, just come. Then when you go through all this, it may give you some ideas of things you didn't know. And that that's why uh, some traditional hackathons, there's not necessarily workshops, but with this, there are, because I, we want you to leave feeling like you learn more about social entrepreneurship. Do people win anything or is this the experience? Yeah, so usually um, it, it depends on the partner. Uh, sometimes they have um, prize funds so that there's some kind of seed funds or in-kind prizes. But I think that is a great motivator to have some um, prizes and recognition. Those are big things. And like how many companies usually pitch each one? Does it depend or? Like... It depends. Like um, I think at in Tacoma, there were about 50 plus participants. And I feel like we had eight to nine pitches. Pitch. Yeah. And you're pitch. providing like pitch coaching for them or anything like that. And you can help I mean, it's, it's, it's a day event. So we, yes, I provide like, um, we do like a workshop and then they, have, if we have mentors around to support, but it all happens quick. But the funny thing, Jason, is that you think, oh, how would we get to a finish line? But we do, like you get to the finish line with folks pitching, you know, and we've done this in as short as like an hour or a few hours and as long as like three days. So I think that's a little bit of um, a good testament to the participants who once they kind of get what this is and now maybe through Shark Tank and some of these other shows, people have a better idea of what they're trying to create at the end, you know? Do you find that extroverts or introverts do better pitching? I, I don't think there is, a yeah, I because I feel like sometimes introverts, they really, in their thoughtful approach, can really, like, I'm, like, I wouldn't be surprised if the, the person who did the phone thing, you know, they could have been an extrovert or yeah. an introvert, but like, just that one way of showing that kind of connected with mm -hmm. so many people in the audience, so. Yes, um, 
So what is this book thing you're doing or I've done before called a pineapple friends? Yeah. Yeah. So the pineapple friends is the, is like a, the new initiative and I'm new to children's books. So it's, it's, I'm a, been a founder of innovate social for a while, but I feel brand new in this space. <clears throat> and it's this idea of introducing problem solving to really young learners. So it all started with my nephews. Um, they must've been five and three at the time. Now they're um, nine and six. Um, uh, but they, uh, you know, I, I saw with them, we took our older nephew, my sister and I to um, a museum and they had like an, you know, the egg drop kind of thing where you, they had some version of that. There wasn't an egg, but they had, he, they, they gave you materials and you had to like create a cushioned kind of thing. And then when it dropped, you had to see would it like, would the, st the, the um, stability of it stay, you know? So they had the machine and stuff, but I just saw how excited he got about that and also how all of the kids that were creating things, they were kind of relying on their natural problem solving to do that. After that, he got into, he learned about Greta Thunberg and he had us write, make um, uh, climate change, you know, um, uh, posters and we stood in the driveway. And I realized it kind of connected a few dots in my mind. One was that all of the news that we see, little kids see too, our, our youngest learners see. And that this is a lot of the issues that are going to be in their lifetime. I can't guarantee that my nephews are there's not going to be a water shortage or you know climate change you know issues that could impact their careers and their livelihoods and their you know um, their lives. But they're also natural problem solvers. So if we can kind of really enhance or empower that that ability, I think that would be really great. So there's um, three books in this process right now that we're working on. They're all animal characters. The first one is called Ali Alpaca Ask Questions. So it's kind of asking like why questions. It's an element of design thinking, um, kind of drawing on some of those elements. And then the second book is Zara Zebra and Sammy Sloth Build Something. So kind of like the idea of building a, min a minimal, minimal viable product MVP. And third one is Tuck Tortoise Pitches. So that idea of being able to tell it a story. So like when kids are young, like you said, they have the sense of awe, inspiration. And it's not like when they get 13, 14, that, that goes away, right? Because you know, <laughs> the peer pressure comes, they become cynical like us. And sometimes with our dogs, like, you know, nothing amazes us anymore. Like, how do we keep this sense of awe throughout our adult life? Yeah, I think um, it's been cool this summer to see some of these major concerts, like the impact that they've had as they've gone into different cities. And I think it's a little reminder that people want to connect. Like for me, I think it's kind of maybe after COVID and all that. So I think maybe when we're talking about teens and young teens, I think that if we start, first of all, there's so many changes happening at that time of life, you know, lots of changes happening. But um, we also maybe it's just like that people want to connect if we start from that positive place. And then maybe if we've just tried different things, like that's why, you know, something like an impactathon or something like an event where people can come together and they can voice their own ideas and come up with their own solutions could give more agency back to, you know, young folks at that time. But I think people do want to connect in meaningful ways. And what's your take on this? Like, so like, you, like you'll, you'll have a like young boy, like six year old boy, right? You went for the mud puddle. Way to go, boy. Great job, right? A girl does it. What are you doing? You know, go put your pink dress on, play with your Barbie, right? I think that's something we're like not doing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so I think that's another thing when we do these events or whenever we bring people together, giving people an equal space at the table, that matters a lot. And I think a lot of times in some in some circles with social enterprise, it, there can be some feeling of elitism that, oh, you, someone studied or did a research this and now they're an expert at solving a problem that's in my community. Like no one's asking me, why, why aren't I at the table if this is a problem? So I think similarly with, having for me it's been amazing to do these events when you have boys and girls guys and girls guys and gals um at the same table and they're equal you know in their ideas and their ability to express their ideas to express the issues and hopefully we as facilitators support that equity too. Well, even as a you know, young boy or girl like a, a boy or girl like about to run the mud for the parent like don't do that you get you get dirty right but you stop them from like learning the experience, yeah. you know, doing that scientific modeling, problem solving, like, oh, I slash some mud, my clothes are dirty now, and my mom's gonna get mad at me. What happens, you know? But yeah. then you stop that. Yeah. Yeah. I saw this great parenting kind of thing that said, rather than say, be careful, kind of say, like enjoy the process or something like like changing when we say be careful, we're already putting this that limitations on. Yes, yeah. yeah. And but it's, so if we rephrase it like you know, like 
enjoy what you're doing or, um, you know, I, I was like, well, that's really powerful. I was like, I, I need to use that self-talk, use that language when I talk to myself too. Cause sometimes we think we go forward and we think, oh no, but like maybe that creates a no in our mind. It creates resistance, you know? So how do you take care of yourself? Um, yeah, you know, I feel like, um, like I think our bodies can really like have an opportunity or want to heal themselves. So I think I, I've been reading books on different things and, um, just trying to, you know, like, a, you know, uh, do things in more natural cycles so that hopefully like I, I can just be a little healthier. So whether it's going for a walk in the mornings when your circadian rhythms are kind of in, in track or to trying to prioritize sleep better. I think when we were younger or maybe some years ago, the hustle culture around was a kind of like, you know, do your day job, then do 10, <laughs> you know, six hours after. But now we're realizing there's more, you know, um, data around how important sleep is and you can't replace it, you know? So I think maybe just trying to sleep better, you know, um, prioritize sleep, you know, doing other things like that. But I am trying to be better about that. That's some, a, a principle for me now. So I'm a TikTok a lot. There's a thing on TikTok now called a hashtag five to nine. And I focus on people telling them what they do from five to nine, right? And we're open, like, no, getting up, go to the gym, you know, uh -huh. do meditation, <laughs> like how we prepare, how they prepare for the day by, you know, being like focused on five, eight, five, eight, nine, eight. I like that. What, what have you learned from that? <sighs> that I suck at it. <laughs> but no, I, I mean, I try to work out and stuff, you know, but I'm not consistent. Yeah. Yeah. At all. Yeah. Um, so back to the pitches, mm -hmm. how, like, of all these pitches you've seen before, like, how do you like keep track of them afterwards, right? Do you keep in touch with these people or they keep in touch with you? How does that work? That's a really good question. That's um, something that has been a challenge, you know, because sometimes you have a great event, you have an event, people are really excited, they pitched, and then on Monday morning, everyone's scattered and they're, you know, so um, we've done different things. Like we have um, a listserv and um, like a discord channel that's not very active, but a few things like that. One of the things I'm we're working on now, an, uh, an idea that's come out of this maybe a little bit is I'm working on like a platform called The Good Pitch. And the idea of that is to like an on-demand pitch platform. So where you could, if you went to an impactathon or a hackathon, you could come in and um, schedule time with a judge or someone that is a uh, subject matter expert, or even just is used to hearing pitches. And, um, and then you could schedule and have them, um, you could pitch them and they could fill out some criteria based on like a form or something. So the hope is that that will keep people engaged. So you have um, one more reason to meet with your team or to work on one more thing, you know? And then how do you keep the people like post, like people suck, suck or suck Southern California pitch? Like how are you gonna make sure those people keep in touch with each other? Yeah, yeah. So if um uh, there's emails sent out with everyone that they have contact information for each other. And then we have some of the, like um, the community building tools and things too. Um, and sometimes like if they're in a university, they often know each other very well outside of that too. Um, and then it can be kind of cool because if there's another opportunity for them to take their idea forward, like um, another pitch competition, um, uh, some of the students in Southern California at Soka University participated in a global social innovation challenge. So we had a chance to work with them more, you know, um, and they got to really work closely with their team. So it can be other, maybe the best way to keep things moving is to keep things moving, yes. you know, yeah. uh, when, it's when we stop, that's when yes. things. Is there like another social ecosystem out there that you aspire to be like or like they're like setting the standard for everyone you want like I, I want to get that to this level um that's a great question you know in some ways for the hackathon style uh startup weekend was a great inspiration for me i love startup weekend i love going to those and um that was great um but for social impact i think there's all they're all kind of different but like ashoka has like a network um there's echoing green they have fellowship programs aspen has a lot of leadership programs um, Stanford as a university has a lot of entry points for social entrepreneurship. They have their so Stanford Social Innovation Review, which is a great um, um, a resource as well. There's many even here with Maritime Blue is building this like ecosystem where there's multiple accelerators and incubators. So I think every, I think we can learn from all of those. And I think if we're ecosystem builders, truly, we're really cross-pollinating. We're not, maybe we're never truly creating, actually, we're always just cross-pollinating and expanding, you know, so you talked about this some before, but go more deep. Like what made me so passionate about doing these these things, like being so involved with this process. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny. I 
it's, I am, I am, I think that's part of my life's, this is my life's work. Like, I may not always be doing it, but I think this is the thing that I have to offer in the world is this, is this work that I'm doing. Um, and I think it comes with some different things. One is moving a lot. And I'm kind of curious, for, I want to, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to ask you this question later, but um, I think that moving in so many different places in us being the ones that saw it, you being the one maybe that saw all these different things, it, it made me feel like, wow, someone doesn't know that these two things are different in these places, but I do because I saw them, you know? So for me, like going to India, going all over the country, even outside of the country, seeing that what impact and equity was different and in places, um, you know, that was one thing. My dad's been really supportive of all of us being leaders. So it was never, was never like, oh, you can't do this because you're a girl or not, there's never something like that. And he, so that's know. a good question, right? Cause I mean, of course I'm not Indian, but you know, hear the stories like that, you know, like India is like real conservative, Father's conservative, you know, there's like a role for the woman, like, and obviously you're not doing the standard, you know, female stuff, right? You know, yeah. housewife stuff. Like, how did that work for you? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it would like every group and family, it's different. But um, um, there, like, I the, the, there's an interesting phenomenon that happened. Some of my friends who similarly were born in the U.S. at the same time as me, we've noticed is that like sometimes our families brought this snapshot of India as they left it. So whatever the um you know, the norms, the cultural norms, some of my, the, the, my cousins in India now, or my, or the folks, in, are, I feel like they're more modern and cooler than me, but we kind of grew up in this snapshot of how we were, you know, wish, you know, we should be or whatever. Um, and some of that can be, I think as we've grown up, we've kind of broken, hopefully we've found a way to break out of that shell and it's the same should energy, you know, do it because you want to do it, like whatever it is, do anything with joy, I do anything, you know, but if it's not something, then do something else, you know, like, so I think um, for me, this leadership thing has been, it's been great to that my dad has been super supportive of that, you know, um, yeah. And so will this be your life's work, you see you doing this until like, you know, your ten toes up, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I feel like in some form or another, like, um, but I, there have been times just like how you mentioned earlier in our conversation, like I have thought I've done what I can with Innovate Social, whoever I've helped, I hope it's good. <laughs> I'm ready to like, you know, go on to the next I'm thing. I'm ready to go make this seven figure salary as a lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. Do something. And then it comes back. The universe brings it back. So I, I hope those things are not mutually exclusive, that this can be the thing that is also super financially, you know, um, uh, that can help me invest in other companies and, and create spaces like that. But, um, but I think that uh, the universe kind of brings it back because it's like, you're not done yet. It's not, it's not time, you know, so that, and then there's the writing. I do want to um, do more creative writing and creative like, like any certain, like, like not, I'm guessing not fiction. Writing. No, like fiction writing. Fiction, fiction yeah. Writing. Yeah. Down like, the line. Yeah, yeah. So like, or any, like any, like, um, like uh, genres or any, like, you know, I've um, like even um, like I've been kind of interested in the, like the lighter actually, like I actually, another part of my life, I like humor and um, there's like that, that joy of some of that. So even this genre of like cozy mysteries where it's like, there's a little lightness to it. You can bring up topics and, and have interesting things happen, but just in a little bit with a lighter touch. I think for me, books have been such a friend throughout my life. And especially the audiobook. sometimes when things are going on, listening to a lighter audiobook has been like a source of such joy and respite you know a break from some of the other things happening so i feel like to create something like that for others would be really fun so is impactathon part of in innovate social or the two yeah. separate entities yeah, i think of innovate social as the umbrella and okay. under that impactathon the book the podcast the children's books are all under the umbrella of impactathon yeah. or, uh, uh, innovate so for that's a profit business yeah it's L we're an llc llc okay and how did that come about uh the llc yeah um, yeah, you know, it's, it's been a sole proprietorship at different times. It's an LLC. Um, and it just it made, it made sense to have a little bit of more formality to the structure and so that all of these things can live under it. Um, and yeah, and then if as the, the identity of each of these things, the good pitch, Impactathon, the books, as those become more clear, if they need to be other structures, we can make that decision. Yeah. So in every social, that's um that's the overarching. Yeah, that's the umbra I can have biggest. I think of the um, that's the umbrella. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, from your point of view, how is that successful? Like, how is that become a success? How is it, or how will it? How will it be a success? Um, 
like, like how, how, how does it succeed? Oh, how does it succeed? Yeah, yeah it, it through all of our content programs and tools, when those are when we are able to create those and when those have traction and they're actually serving and there's a business model around those, I think then the company, you know, that's when the company is successful. Of course, follow up question, how does it fail? Yeah, it, you know, I think it fails when we aren't coming up with new products, when no one is using them, when we're, we're, we're ineffectively um, distributing them. Um, so those are kind of the... And what's, what's this business model? Like, how, how do you make money? Yeah, so with each of these, I guess each of the the products and tools has its own kind of sub-business model. Um, Impactathon has a program fee. There's consulting and coaching. That's on a fee basis. Um, the books, you know, have their own sales. Um, the podcast um, was more, I think it, it we, we didn't have sponsors for that when I was doing that. Next time when I come back to it, it'll be great to do that. But I think it opened up a lot of doors and it connect, uh, created some deeper connections. And also I was doing that early on in this when I wasn't, when I couldn't, I, I didn't say I was an expert in this because I wasn't, I was exploring this space. So, um, so that, yeah. And then even the children's books I'm excited for. Um, to be able to do some workshops around them with kids too. So, and what's your, do you have a marketing plan? Like, do you, how do you tell people this stuff? This word of mouth, social media, like you post on organically on your Instagram. Like, how do you like, yeah, know about this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, at different points, we've had me, a social media team um, supporting some of this. And then um, right now, it's maybe doing it a little bit more um, ad hoc, piece by piece, you know. And so, with the impact of thons and everybody, so full, you're, you're nationwide. And of course, you're, folk, you're, you're here in Tacoma, but have you found a certain area like response to it better than other areas? Um, like ge ge uh, geographically? Geographically, yeah. um, geographically, I would say, um, you know, I would say the West Coast, just because I've spent more time here, both in California and Pacific Northwest, I feel like there is a lot of innovation entrepreneurship happening. We did one in New York City, which was really cool, um, right on Fifth Ave. That was really awesome. So yeah, I think every place, it's the people, you know, you bring people together, talk about ideas, amazing things happen, you know. And so how you do with the logistics? Like, uh, you know, obviously you take some plan, like fly people, like fly to New York City, Southern California, like you do all the logistics stuff yourself. You have some like, team helping you. Yeah, um, we have a, a team that kind of come together for some of the events and they're amazing. And then a lot of it is we're working with like always a partner. So kind of coordinating some of that with the partner and then whatever logistics, you know, now we have some different um, mapping and flowing after doing some events so we can kind of start using the checklists and things, you know. And tell me again, how do you find these partners or, or do they find you? Yeah, both. It kind of happens. Some of our partners, it's been great. They they were part of an Impactathon and then they wanted to bring yes. Impactathon to their community. I always love those. Some folks have found the work online and some of it been through kind of a connection. Maybe we've or, you know, done a workshop together, done something together, and we want to do more together. What's some pros and cons about being an entrepreneur? Um, I think the cons, I'll start with the cons, um, is it can feel like you're part of the world and you're also separate from it. Like you're observing other people do things and kind of mm -hmm. move on in their lives in different ways. And you're you feel like you're an observer sometimes. And I'm like, I'm not an observer. I'm, <laughs> I'm here too. That can be a tough thing. Um, it can be tough because I think it can become so much of your identity in your life um, where, you know, that it's, it's not a nine to five thing where you say, I finished, I'm done. I closed, you know, I, I left yeah, the office. It's nine to five, 9 a.m. to 5 a.m. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think those are the challenges. Of course, they can create instabilities with our financials and things like that, which means maybe it can hinder our ability to, um, I don't know, buy a house, do this, you know, do the things that we want um, in that way that can be. But on balance, there's no limit to what you can do, what you can grow, how much wealth you can accumulate. And I think with the positives are like, um, I love this quote. And I think, I wonder if we both might resonate with it. Like it takes over a decade to become an overnight success. Yeah. Like yeah. I have no doubt that this production value, it's at some point, it's going to be the thing that people will find you and will know you will be known for it. It might mean that you create hundreds of episodes. Yeah. Yeah. And then down five years down the line, 10 years down the line, someone's like, we want, we want Jason. Uh, overnight success. Yes. Overnight. All and, these sponsorships come in. Yes. Any, it uh, will happen. It, everyone emails it's the nature of, podcast, Yeah. 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 Um, so I think that's the thing is that it will, it takes time. And that's why I feel like 
you know, if, as long as we like what we're doing, you know, if we hate it, then we should do something else, you know, but if we like it, then it, I think things will connect. The dots will connect. At least the work will get. And the nice thing about the things that you're creating is you don't need to wait once, like even right now, people may be watching. Yeah. And if they got one thing out of our conversation yeah. that they can put into their lives, like you got, you, you got to sing the song <laughs> that was in your heart. Like yeah, this, exactly. is, this is the song in your heart, yeah, like is exactly. to create this, uh, to create this cool podcast. So I think in that way, that's really special. And I, I don't know if there's a story. I, I do want to. I'm. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Okay, too. Right. but before, um, before you do that, yeah, people don't realize like Apple.com Apple like eight years, right? People think you know, like, um, and Steve Bank. What was his name? Uh, Steve, Steve Jobs Kelsey. and Wozniak. Yeah, like start up, build a computer on Monday, and like Munich from Tuesday. Yeah. Right? It was an eight year process, right? Like, yeah, and you know, it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, and I don't know if you forget that, right? Yeah, like, shit, I've been yeah. there for six months and you haven't yeah, done nothing, but totally. it's a long process, it's, right? And there's things out of our control, so like you're creating the content with the best faith effort. Mm -hmm. People may not find it. The person that needs to find this, this episode may not find it for another six months. Yeah. Then they'll contact you. And then that, that'll be the start of another connection. So yeah. there's a, I think there's a kismet too. Like there's yeah. like, a, 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 you have to put the things out there, but mm -hmm. we can't control everything. We can't say I control when it's out and when someone responds yeah, to it. Can't do that. We can't like, do you it. can't like email every single person on your LinkedIn Hey, John, Bob, this is my podcast, you know, here's a link, you know, that's impossible. But when they have the question and they say, oh my gosh, I have this question and Jason interviewed this person for two hours. Yeah. I'm going to listen to that now because I have the exact question, you know, then, then they'll come out and then you'll be the hero in the story, you know? So are you a nighttime person, daytime person? I think I'm a morning, morning yeah. person. So this is my challenge, right? So I, I mean, I think I do my best work for like, you no, know, 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. But also I think do my best work from like, 9 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. Oh, okay, okay. So obviously, you know, if I go to sleep at 1 a.m., wake at 5 a.m., I yeah. can't do that, right? Yeah, so yeah. I've always had trouble, like, how do I like, figure that out, right? Yeah. How have you figured it out? I haven't. You haven't, yeah. I haven't, yeah. Um, what, I want to ask you a question okay. about um, what is the, like, is there something that made you want to start all of this? And the the HR, the cabinets, now you're doing the WeFunder, like, is there something that kind of reminds you every day that this is why I'm kind of like, doing this part of it we like i like to say entrepreneurs we need to take some kind of mental illness test you know because we all of us have this kind of mental illness to do this you know that's that's part of you know just like you just have a belief what you're doing right i mean like like i want to save small business owners time and money on hr right and it always goes after that right no matter how off you know, off you get the right and another thing we don't talk about either like all these like a lot of us like i used to like shiny objects right you know have someone else wait six months do that kind of stuff too you mm -hmm. know but it's, it's yeah it's I was going to that. Yeah. Is it HR in particular that has, was there some HR experience that kind of made you feel like someone's got to do that better? Yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you a story. So I did HR in the army, right? So when I was retired, you know, the army told you to go on LinkedIn find, try to find a job, right? So I'm on LinkedIn, connect with people. This guy named Mark Rue reached out to me. He said, hey, Jason, my name is Mark Rue. I have a startup called Meyer Fold. We want to help college graduates and military veterans find jobs by doing skills tests, right? Can we meet you? Tell me how the army's gonna meet you. You know, how do you find a job? I'm like, sure. One question: What the fuck's a startup? Right? Had no clue, no concept. Right? You did laugh right up. We met. He gave me like MVP stuff, name market, all that kind of stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. And so a light bulb goes off. I'm like, you never talk about HR. I don't. Well, we don't do HR. It's down the road, right? So I said, hey, let me join your startup. I do HR for you. There's other stuff for you, right? And so we were at the start for two years. Of course, they failed, right? But you see, I'm like, none of these startups had, had HR, right? So maybe I can do a business doing HR for startups. Mm -hmm. And then of course I went to small business because kind of startups have money. I'm doing I'm not doing this well, pro bono, right? Mm -hmm. And of course I did the business research, you know, for the SBA, there's like five million companies, four nine or fewer people, most of them HR because though like, HR person like me is like 50,000 more pure plus benefits, they can afford that. Mm -hmm. You have the HR companies like Zenefits, um, ADP, they're like non-responsive, everything's a template. Mm -hmm. And then HR consultants, that's how we want to put our business, right? HR consultants like. Of course, there's three good ones. To me, the most of them are like this. Like, you hire me to be HR consultant. I come and check out your HR stuff. Hey, you need this, this, and this. And mm -hmm. you're paying me $300 an hour, right? And you're like, well, I know I need this stuff. We're going to make it for you. Oh, no, I don't. I, I consult you, right? So you're going to pay me $300 an hour to tell you what you know? It makes no fucking sense, mm -hmm. right? So we're, we're off that, right? Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, that's great. It's cool connection between HR in the Army. Yeah. And then bringing it out. And, yeah. and, and also, I kind of think, do you think some of your Army training gives you a way to make it more efficient like oh yeah, of, definitely, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely yeah yeah another thing about the army army they do a good job of like kicking your teeth nine times and yeah. having you get up the 10th time you know yeah so resilience well offline i've met some really cool kind of folks that are veterans and are in the startup space or supporting and so i want to connect you to some folks that okay. i'll do by LinkedIn because i feel like 
they would love, I mean, it would be, it could be a really cool connection. So oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, fine. Yeah. And it's, and it's really neat because I think people, when you're a civilian, which I am, it's very different when you have served. And I think that that bond mm -hmm. is so strong, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. And so I think that there, there, there's a lot of camaraderie that happens even out after, you know, that's a shared experience, right? Even yeah. if you did something totally different, right? You know, like y'all did PT, y'all yeah. did this, you know, there's totally. something, yeah. y'all did basic training. Y'all had something, even though you might have done three, four years, different time yeah. or whatever, you know, the process is still the same. Yeah, totally. Awesome. And you go to South, like, you know, oh man, this sucked, that sucked, you know, I remember yeah. this, you know, how to eat MREs for 23 days. You yeah. Know, or, yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. So no, no, I'm excited. I'm, and I, yeah, so I'm, we'll, 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 uh, we'll see if hopefully there's some connection there. So. Yes, nice. Um, any more questions? Um, any more questions? Yeah, like, I guess I want to wonder now, when did we, when did you start Cavernous HR? Okay, so I originally started it you know, it's the Kevin's HR podcast. Oh. I talked to other HR people, right? Okay. Like maybe 20, 30 minutes real fast, right? Yeah. And then again, the light bulb moment, why am I talking to people who are not going to buy what I'm selling, right? Uh -huh. Like an HR director from like whatever company is not going to buy my HR services, right? Yeah. And so I, and plus like 30 minutes for so fast, right? Yeah. And like, it's yeah. just like bullshit it's, question, yeah. right? Yeah. So then I flipped it like basic. Well, I won't say that because my, uh, my podcast, I ended up going a little shorter, yeah. but um, so I, I, mean, hope each, each, I hope they I won't mean, be as questions. I mean, each style is their own style, right? Yeah. You know, and plus I'm curious because I have all these questions I want to ask you, right? Yeah. And so basically, I, I basically let's copy Joe Rogan's style, yeah. right? Okay. Did like that, you know? There's no to have more longer impact, you know? Plus like the longer podcast I can like do, like after this today, I'll do like five, six minute clips, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you, you have more do, content. You can yeah. do a 30-minute 30, 30 yeah, podcast, yeah, right? And good. so instead of talking to HRP, I was talking to like small business owners, entrepreneurs. Yeah. That's like this interest in people, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. No, I and do you love the production part of it? Like the making the clips? You do a lot of this. Love myself, yeah. Yeah. Do you enjoy that? You know, I don't enjoy it. I wish I could pay someone to like I wish I had a young Jamie like Joe Rogan does, you know. <laughs> But I've tried to give it up. Like I went on Fiverr, all these yeah. different places. Are like, it's hard, yeah. this is, are you kidding me? Right? Like, yeah. it's so horrible, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like one time I had a guy like edit a podcast for me and I told him, hey, at the 35 minute mark, my guest has a cough deck three minutes and you take it. Oh, no problem. Of course, it's still in there, you know? Yeah. It's, and of course they say, you know, if they do 80% of the job, you do it, that's fine, you know? But like, but like you said, the audio and stuff, it has to be like, yeah. not perfect, perfect. Like, you know? but, but when you know what it can be, yeah. It becomes the enemy of like just getting it. at the beginning. I didn't even edit. I would just, mm -hmm. and then once I started finding tools and I could um edit like silences and mm -hmm. ums. After a while, I I don't know how to explain, but you can see an um. You can yeah. You, you can, can see yeah. it right. You, you can, can yeah. And then I couldn't not take them out, you know. But then it would take like a thirty or forty minute podcast. I you're probably way faster than me. Could take me like ten hours. I was the same way. Like when I first started, even with a thirty minute podcast, I'll take it every single um. It was yeah. a long process, and then. Yeah. By accident, so I use Adobe Edition. Uh -huh. There's a tool in there where like, instead of like you post a chart podcast, you can listen to one hour, right? Uh -huh. so, like double the speed, right? Okay, okay, different okay. things. But now I don't edit no more unless like, like okay. oh, you had a coughing attack, you know, or yeah, yeah. ask your question. Like, you're like, Jason, that's a, you know, I'm a, I have a brain lock. Give me like three minutes, you know, yeah, or yeah, like yeah, yeah. close one of us had to go to the bathroom across to take that stuff out. But yeah, 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 yeah that's good. And so maybe that's how you found your efficiency for that too. Yeah. But um, the one good thing is, I think, and I wonder if you could, there's something really fulfilling about sharing content. Like, it is, yeah. And especially when there's something I would always love, like even this conversation, I feel like I will leave feeling like I learned something mm -hmm. too, you know? Um, and so like, yeah, so I think that that's the really, um, when you're doing other things, that the fulfillment is different. I think that the fulfillment when I was creating more of the podcast mm -hmm. was really deep. It was yeah, really deep yeah. fulfillment. Yeah. And of course, like I, said, I repurpose kind of, of course, there's a selfish reason, right? So like yeah. we'll do this podcast. I think the podcast is going to be released, I think sometime in September, right? Okay. And probably three months later, I'll release it again, right? So three months later, you'll see your name tag. Oh, shit. Okay. I forgot about the podcast with Jason. Yeah. What's Jason up to? Let me yeah. call him up. Yeah. Do something, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. Reconnect you, right? That's cool. So, okay. Got the, I got the agenda and the hidden agenda. All right. Yeah. Got it. I'm set. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Um, What's your like, big vision it's like if if like if you could if cavernous hr could grow on whatever with the we funder support i, I want to like i want to like put adp trying out for all the companies like okay, this i want to okay. be like number one hr company i want to like, 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 okay company. awesome okay yeah. cool yeah well luckily hr is something that a company from a small size to a yeah. very large size needs isn't is there like a social impact aspect of your work or that you're trying to develop oh, man i have to get back to on that one yeah I mean, besides, we, we, should, we should talk I, about that. I mean, I think it's, I mean it's, besides it's, giving people jobs, I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. But maybe we should, we can talk offline because yeah. there might, it seems like you're aligned with some of yeah. these things and even this content creation. I mean, I, like, I want to be like a diverse remote country, you know, yeah. like, you know, like yeah. we're a pretty diverse team, you know, so. Yeah. 
but yeah, no, I think we should chat. We could, because there's some cool business models around that. And it sounds like you're already doing a lot, you know, so um, yes. maybe yes. there's some things. That's, those are the questions I had. Okay. Thank you for entertaining me and letting yes. me ask yes. them. <laughs> yes, yes, my pleasure. Uh, so what, what's your like, um, what's your goal as far as like personally, right? Like you want to be like a known as like, you know, the Oprah Winfrey of social impact. You like just want to like, you want to get your success from learning other people successful or like what you're like, what, yeah. what, I guess what's your, what do you want your impact to be at the end of the day? Yeah. Like, you know, um, one thing we haven't talked about is my, I lost my mom 17 years ago to uterine cancer when I was in my last year of law school. Um, and you can Google her name. She won't show up anywhere. She's not, on, she there was before Facebook. She didn't have an iPhone, to, but she is one of the people that has impacted my life. I, there's probably not like a moment that I'm, she's not somewhere in my energy or in my thoughts. So I kind of realize even the most Oprah-ish of Oprah's in human times in, a, in 10, 15, 20 years, we're not going to, like it, those things are so ephemeral. Like they will pass through our fingers like sand, like, you know, so I feel like I don't know about fame. I mean, fortune in the sense of being able to do more. I am excited about that because then you can create funds, you can invest in others. Fame, I don't know, it, it actually, because in, in practice, it, in my life experience, I don't know that that matters. But I think when we create, even in the moment, even in the moment that we're in, if we can create a positive experience or send good energy, and that person that received it can accept it and then maybe pass it on, I think that's all. That's all that we really even have. So if the things that I create, create moments where people feel like something is possible, their ideas are possible, um, making a change is possible, that what they do matters. Like, even if it's for a moment, I think that's all. I, I don't know if that, I don't know, I don't know if that, that's a really, but that that's all because nothing else, like it's not going to like last, you know? I don't even think about it unless like a Roman emperor or like Teddy Roosevelt, no one remembers you. Like, like who, who, who can name the U.S. Senator from the state of Kentucky in 1820? Yeah. No one can. Yeah. I, I think someone said like, you know, if you die, by the time your great great grandkids are there, is, you're forgotten about, right? Uh, it's yeah. Two or three generations down, you're, yeah. you're forgotten about. What's to be remembered? I don't even, I am not interested. In fact, in this day and age, we know the words fame and fortune when we were growing up were like always together. Mm -hmm. I think anyone would want to have, to have fortune without fame now yeah. because you that means you have all these things in your in, on your feed, yeah. all these people that are taking you down, Nobody all these trolling you, trolling you. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, I think social media has changed that. Yeah, I, think, I think when people get their fifty minutes of fame, they were like, "Oh shit, maybe I don't want the fifty minutes <laughs> of fame." fame. Like, I think the fortune. I don't want the fame. Just let someone else have that. <laughs> yeah, but some people like the fame and fortune. Like some yeah. people like being famous. You know, yeah. I mean, obviously, Kardashians are probably the most famous ones yeah. right now. You know. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I wonder for them too, if if you're looking back on it, if they could have had what they have without having the fame maybe they would have another like they their pathway to that was the fame yeah. but i wonder if they would say you know what and i don't we like wanna... see how it's gonna affect their kids in the long run like yeah. 25 years like they're like are they basic cases you know yeah, are they like functioning yeah. members of society you know yeah yeah and i'm sure there's some probably wisdom that they've learned of how to handle it that we as normalish but i'm i'm a very normal person yeah. like maybe i would one day want to know how did they handle all the negative yeah. thing you know and I mean, still can you imagine wake up camera and you go in the bathroom look at this camera right there in your face <laughs> you don't make up right so but yeah it's interesting i feel like when a lot of that was coming up some years ago like the um what do they call it? reality tv all yeah. that stuff now i feel like we're in this post phase where sometimes people don't want like it you know yeah. i, I, I kind of think that like the kids that grew up with their cute videos being posted when they are older they'll be like that's embarrassing i wish yeah. that wasn't up there you know oh, yeah like how many parents you know not posting stuff for the kids on social media right yeah when you uh, have, what is this mom like are you kidding me right now yeah yeah so that's interesting and, or, or maybe they'll be like thanks because now i have this account following, like, following yeah. and i can do things with it and i can like you know grow and stuff so i don't know it's a it's a mix we're in this i think we're in the wild west we're still like we don't know the effects of a lot of these things no. we don't know what's going to happen you know so we'll find out so how do you use some social media to improve your social impact yeah i mean it's i think it's a like i think storytelling i love storytelling in writing and i think um these methods and platforms give us a way to tell our story in all lengths and, I, and that way i think it's actually a gift people in a tiktok that's like 30 seconds they can like express so much or show a talent that they're could, so, they're no, so talented, so right? talented then in, 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 in no other way could they showcase that talent like there's a woman that i'm following um who goes underwater and then does these cool like dances but like she is her angles are very like 
like I don't I don't remember it. But I was like, where else could she showcase that talent? Yeah. Like you can't do it on a stage. Yeah. Like you know, how would anyone know that she has this incredible talent? You know, or people. There was one. I don't know if he does things now, but on um on Instagram, he used to he created these amazing um vegan smoothies that were like that had like shapes of animals. Like mm -hmm. it was just I, I could insane, crazy. insane yeah. crazy. And I was like. I was like, people are so talented. I think that's the one thing that it's unlocked people's ability to share their talent in a way that they want to do. Like they don't have to go to an agent and say, no. and prove it to someone. They can just start an account. I have Tim and follow on TikTok, you know, like yeah, what it exactly. could be. And so I can't think of his name, but his guy said, his, he's a movie director named Kevin. He made the movie called Clerks, or like, or like movies like that. He was talking about like, if TikTok was around when he was like making movies, he said he wanted to make a movie, right? Because like, there's so much talent that like, he would have been intimidated by all the yeah. time. Like, you're like, there's nowhere, I'm nowhere close to this, right? Because yeah. luckily for me, that wasn't around. I thought I knew what I was doing. And I got yeah. lucky, he made middle week clerks. Yeah. And became a millionaire. Now he makes movies all the time. He's yeah. like, yeah. I was today, there's no way I'll put myself out there. Yeah. But like, I I'm, I'm nowhere close to this, right? Yeah. 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 And I, that, that's a good point. Like, it could be intimidating because they, you know, like, if, if if I hadn't done my podcast already and I walked into your podcast, I'd be like, <laughs> I don't know how to do all, all of this. And I, again, I wish you could all see the cameras and the setup here, but um, you know, I would do it with my phone and my like plug in and I do it super lean. It was enough. It was yeah. the, the, the quality was enough. I found ways to make it a little better. So yeah, I think um, there's a, a balance of being intimidated and being inspired. Yeah. If that makes sense, you know, being fearless and yeah. fearless. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, you know, every day you probably have a thousand priorities, right? How do you make sure you do priorities one and two versus number nine ninety seven? Yeah, you know, I've been uh, telling people that this year has been so interesting because working and um, doing the important legal work and like working with clients, that's like three days, three days a week, and then trying to shift gears and work on my business and then work on the books. Um, so I, I kind of just have been telling myself like, be where my feet are, if that makes any sense. Because like then focus, I focus, and, and try not to like. I can worry about something, but if that's not, if I'm not in the office to do that, then my worrying about it is not, you know, if I'm in the office, the days that are there, I just need to be there with those clients and that matters and those issues. And then on the other days, be in the that place, you know, if I'm in a meeting with someone about Innovate Social, then just turn everything else off and be there. I'm not the best at it, but I, it's something, it's like a mantra that I say in my mind, just be, be, be where your feet are. And it kind of just kind of calms my energy down a little bit, you know, because really, you know, they've shown studies that sh think that when that show that when we think we're multitasking, we're yeah, not, we're not, only doing one thing at a yeah, time because yeah, you're we're not just doing four things. At yes. Time. You're just going for like one minute, one minute. Yes. One minute, yeah. yeah. So and when you, I, and your brain tricks, in and it tricks in, you into thinking it, that you're doing. It, it, yeah. You're not, yeah. So it, with that, it actually gives me some peace actually, you know, but it does make you feel like you're doing more stuff. You're yeah. That, even though you're not. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you're just toggling between yeah. tabs, so to speak of your, of your priorities. Like your laptop so yeah so what's something that's on your bucket list that you have not done yet that you want to do um i would love to do an impactathon internationally i would love to do one in bombay actually bombay, okay because that's where my family's yeah. from and i've done some things that would be really special a full circle kind of moment um i would love to right now we do one impactathon at a time so it's a, the sales cycles are long and stuff I would love to figure out a way that we know we're doing 10 impactathons mm -hmm. and our focus then becomes um, where, how are they connected? What's the team? You know, um, I would love that. Um, I would love to enter in my mind the next level of thinking big. Cause I think sometimes when we're entrepreneurs, we're so used to being that frog on the, on the lily pad, jumping from one lily pad to another. But when we think big and I think, you know, we, Elon Musk is not, I, I don't know, he's a, he's a genius, but lots of cha challenges with him too. But I think one thing is he can think big and he must've been able to think big even much earlier, you know, when he had nothing. But so that ability to us, for us to think big about our work, like, cause then we can start like exponentially moving things, you know, changing things. So. I'm a firm believer that if you can, if you can imagine, you can do it, right? Yeah. I don't care how crazy off the wall it is. Yeah. Now, of course, maybe if you imagine you could build an escalator from here to Mars, maybe not that, you know. Yeah, but, or maybe not in your lifetime. Or yeah. Who knows, you know. Yeah. Maybe we'd, we'd learn how to breathe, you know, space air. Yeah, know. yeah. So, let's see what else. So, as far as like, that's more like a business bucket list. Like, what's a personal bucket list? Like, you want to dive on a plane, travel around the world? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think um, I would like to travel more. That would be really awesome. Um, 
and maybe eventually like adopt kids. That's been on my mind. Maybe having lost a mom, like I feel like there are kids. That like, mom thinks they come in. Yeah. Like in that sense of like having lost a mom to no fault of our own, there are kids that have don't have a mom to no fault of their own. Maybe there's a cycle or circle, but it would want to be in a different stage of things right now. I feel like I'm right now the relationship and the child is the, is the company is the work, you know? Uh, so some of that. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, I, I feel like, yeah, I just kind of to always be able to have to live a life in a way that I can say yes to yeah. things that I want to do always, you know, like if I want to start a new thing, like, and that means there's a certain amount of stability. Maybe the network is also really strong that I could one day call Jason up because we're in a different stage yeah. of all this and be like, Hey, just, I had this idea. I want to come run it by you. Yeah. Can we like launch a version of it? And you're like, yeah, let's, let's, I think so. You know, like have that kind of thing where we can think about ideas and have the network to just try them out and, them. So as a female, do you find it this side of society pressure where you have to have it all? Like you have to have the, the career, be a mom, be a wife. You, is that still going on or is that something important? Maybe I feel so off the beaten track of anyone. Like, like again, maybe this is the observer part of it. And maybe even after losing our mom, I almost look at in, families that are Indian that were like our family and be like, oh, that's a nice Indian family. Like, oh my, but I'm also that <laughs> because I feel like it put me in that observer place as well. Uh -huh. So I think now I hope I'm not in that should energy. Anything now is I hope comes from a place of purpose and joy, like anything, because I don't think it's worth it for me. Otherwise, like I'm now way off the, I've missed every train. You know? <laughs> I'm on my own path now. So just do things that like make sense and hopefully impact others in a positive way. Um, and I kind of feel like if it doesn't happen in this lifetime, any, anything, it's okay. Like, that's okay. Like, I'm not like, I'm not incomplete. I'm a whole person. Um, I feel really fulfilled if it all ended tomorrow, I, my song is out. Like, you know, whatever I had to sing or whatever I had to share is out. I just want to do more of it, you know? Um, but I, I don't want to live a, a half-life like where it's yeah. not complete because of X, Y, Z, because that's just, this is not what I want to do. <laughs> so do you like, do you work every day? Do you take vacations once in a while? Like how do you do that? Yeah, you know, I think I, like some of those times kind of, um, and uh, flex and my, my nephews are in the Bay Area. So I've been trying to go at least once a month to see my family there. Um, that's a kind of a first priority mm -hmm. for me. Um, and yeah, and try to see friends when I can. I love, you know, I, I love laughing. I love yeah. hanging out and, 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 and being able to joke around and, and have some lighter moments too. But I think sometimes when we're working on these big things, that is not always available. Like I don't feel in that lightness yeah. to go and hang out because I, I feel like these things have to get done. And with the children's book, now I have a great illustrator, but there was a few months when we were in between and I just felt like these books, I don't know how we're going to birth these, but how are these books going to get out in the world? Um, but now it feels like we have a little pathway now there. So what's something that you like you're doing right now as a false entrepreneur, as like a PCKT, right? There's no problem. And you're like, man, this was such a challenge back in the day. You're like, how is this a challenge? It's so easy for me to do. Oh, I love that question. Um, I think not always, but I think public speaking now feels much more authentic and natural to me uh, than it did when I was starting. And I did so many talks, you know, and everything. And I felt, but I feel like now it just comes from such a like tried and tested place. You know, I kind of think of that with these artists too, like. Beyonce and Taylor Swift touring right now. I don't know when 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 people will listen to this, but right now they're on tour. But I was like, they're so seasoned in their work that I don't. They might have some anxiety, and they we probably all do. But once they're in that place, it's their it's their like their wisdom of having been a performer it comes through, you know. So I hope now maybe for me doing this for a while, the wisdom of of speaking or sharing is more calm, more connected. So you already talked about Innovate H Social some. Can you go like more detail how it got started, what you're focused on now, what the big dream vision for it is? Yeah, you know, um, I was, after law school, I worked um, in a few different places at a nonprofit and then at Find Law, which is a Thomson Reuters company and was part of their first social media team. And so blogged um, before, um, you know, like, you know, before I'd ever, I'd never blogged before. And so when I started learning about social enterprise, starting Innovate Social as a blog made sense because I had done that more, you know, uh, professionally as well. So um, that's how it started, you know, a lot of content creation, um, the blog posts, uh, looking at the legal structures that were emerging for businesses creating impact and, um, and profit. And, um, you know, then that kind of expanded to the podcast, the book, uh, workshops, Impactathon, consulting, um, and now like the children's books and the 
and the the on-demand pitch tool. So um, yeah, so I, I think it's been an evolving process. I think um, my vision for it has like I would I I think hiring people, especially as a social enterprise, is a huge milestone. When so right now we have contractors, but I don't have I don't have full time staff. So I'm excited for if that is the way that this is going to grow. Um, I'm excited for that. Yes. Um, so when you think you're going to be to that part where you're going to start hiring people, is it is that based on revenue, based on like just how you feel? What's going to be based on? You know, I think because right now it's almost like we do it on an event basis. When we know we have an event, it's easier to bring the team on for that. So to um, ha have a business model where we can think that much in the future, maybe that's where if we do have the plan where some we're a partner or a grant allows us to do 10 impactathons, then that'll be easier to kind of plan out. Or maybe I meet someone who has a complimentary, complimentary skill set. I feel like I'm a that visionary person and I um, am great at setting up systems, but there are people that are great at yeah, doing the details. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if someone, if I meet someone and we want to work together, maybe through that, it'll give confidence to like, take this to another stage, you know? Um, but otherwise I think, yeah, just, keep doing the things, but, but, uh, but I'm, I, in that way, fiscally a little bit more conservative. I want to make sure that I can value the person. You want to make sure you can pay them yes, for it, like at least yeah. a year versus, oh my yeah, God. Yeah. Or then, or then I'd rather do it as a contract basis because yeah. I want to value them. So back to your immigration lawyer thing. So your clients you have, like, do they have 24 seven access to you? They only contact a certain number of days or how does that work? Um, I wouldn't say 24 x seven access, but I think, you know, reasonable like business out mm -hmm. business hours access. And I think, um, you know, with immigration law, a lot of it is like, it's like, um, volleying, you know, back and forth, like, okay, we need these documents. Okay. Now get those documents together. Now we'll fill out the forms. Now review the form. Like, so it's a lot of times it's like, we're doing, we're doing some work and then we're giving some homework to our client and then they're doing some work and then we're doing some, you know, and then we file and then we wait a long time. So it's a, there's a, like a, you, you kind of get into a rhythm of it, but it's not like, um, it's different than some things that are like, we have a, like a court date now we have to do it. It's a different kind of a rhythm, you know? So it's more like making sure that we cross all our T's and dot our I's and are really, um, mindful of that and we're aware of the process and any risks that could be there for the client you know and who provides that translation services well, that's a good question um it can be sometimes um if it's like for their documents then they might for a lot of the documents they can have someone that they know like a family member translate but they have to make sure that they do it within the requirements for that document um if it's for language they sometimes um will bring in a family member to help or, uh, we, you know, have a translator to help, or, you know, so it's a different kind of mixed bag of things. Okay. And for those people going to go into the process, back to this real fast, like, do you, do you, do you find that like, they're like the out of war? Like, do they kind of give up at a certain amount of time to get dejected or are they always like a beat? Like, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get to America. Oh, it's, um, yeah, I guess it depends on what their journey is. Um, I think that there can be. Um, there can be some tough news with, with immigration, you know, depending on what their situation is and do they fit into some exception? Is there some, you know, um, pathway? But I think as the immigration attorneys, we also want to be as honest as we can about, you know, the pathway, you know, so that we're not promising something, you know, because that's a tough thing too, right? Someone said I, like this would work, you know? So I think being, but then on balance, like some things just take a while. I always say with immigration law, it's step by step. So sometimes you know you want to get to the end, but you have to do this one filing. Wait for the response. Then once you get your green card, then you, you know, then you can do the next. Of course, thing. Then the next patient thing. easier said than done. It's you know? absolutely no, and I think that's why there's a lot of empathy in that in that kind of space because it can just take a long time. But sometimes, like someone's like, oh, I want to bring my family member over, and we say it's possible. It's just that you need to get your immigration status situated, and then you can apply for them. Like you can, because then you'll you'll if it's your parent or some uh, 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 one of the qualifying relationships that can work. But you just have to do it step by step. And even though we we want to fast forward to the last step, that doesn't work that way. We have to do the first step. You know, respond to USAIS, get their response, get their you know, and then kind of take it one step at a time. So I'm I'm making this up probably, but what is something called where like I think like New York City. LA, the barrier, Seattle, I think they're famous, like where like, if you're a legal immigrant, I don't know what the title is, like you're an immigrant and you break the law or do something bad, you get to go to that city. Um, what's that called? Um, man, what's it called? Um, city of something. It was like a big controversy, like mm -hmm. Bay City, I, mean, I can't think what it's called. Um, 
sanctuary city sanctuary city mm -hmm. what what is the sanctuary city um yeah okay i found this on the web for sanctuary city what was the sanctuary <laughs> <laughs> well that'll be edited out <laughs> that's funny um yeah sanctuary cities um as far as i understand them are ones where they're not enforcing some of those that's what it is yeah yeah things so they've kind of um, uh, and so that's you know, enforcing some of the um, immigration um, infractions or things like that. So they kind of are often publicly saying that. So it's kind of a sanctuary. Um, yeah. And I haven't worked closely in those for the kinds of immigration law that I do now. Okay. But um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think that that's a way that some cities have been able to be proactive to mm -hmm. show allyship i guess you know and show support and that's it's important and if you're taking like people like governor sanis governor uh abbott like sending like immigrants to, like new york city i think one of them sent to martha's vineyard you know like yeah. what's your viewpoint on that yeah i i feel like it kind of um i think like it minimizes the people involved and i don't that's that's mm -hmm. it's unsettling like oh just bust someone here you know if you heard some of the stories of what people have done for the hope of a better life for their children. It's like, it's, it's, you know, um, it's tough to think that we're no, like kind of, because it's done often as a media kind of thing. And there are people, these so are real what people. What about the people, know? some people have like, well, of course we want to send to New York city because New York city is liberal and they're probably great. While well, Texas, Arizona boards like getting slammed. Why not like leave our press and send them to a place that says they want to take care of these people. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I just feel like it's that's not the spirit that it's done in. Mm -hmm. It's done in like a way to do like, see, look, you know, yeah. see, how do you like that? You know, and I think in another way, if we could get people at the table and say, okay, these are human beings that have gone and, and already been through harrowing experiences mm -hmm. by the time they even reach, even have the opportunity. So if this person was a billionaire, would they be treated like, you know, I mean, just saying like, if they had a person of means, like, would they, we would be yeah. like singing, you know, we'd be like, oh, are you, you know, and here we're like, even once they come, they're like, oh, just shift, you know, as, as I, I think that that the regard to, I don't know, that, that, that is uh, troubling to me. But I think what we could do is just say, like, I, there is a real toll on certain cities that are geographically near the border, but could we get together and say, how do we kind of, also so is that the responsibility of the federal government, state government, local government? Because I know like one city in Texas, I, I can't remember, it was like the population was like 20,000, like almost like 300,000 immigrants, right? And of course that city can't do anything about it, right? So it's like, who's responsibility? Who's be stepping up in those cases? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think maybe you have to, to kind of have some conversations and see, because that is a, fe you know, it's a government, it's a federal it's border. Homeland security maybe. Yeah, homeland security. And and I think that there, there definitely need to be some change, you know, some updates and changes there because this is only going to increase because of climate change and many other um, and um, civil in instabilities in other countries. So this is so we just have to we can't ignore it and say it's not happening. We have yeah. to say it's probably it's almost like when you build a freeway, you don't build a freeway for the <laughs> traffic you have now. You yeah, build it for future. thinking yeah. what's going to happen in five years. So I think we need to start thinking about policies of like when things happen so we're not at that time with you know um and so i i i am hoping that i know there are a lot of incredibly intelligent smart passionate people involved in immigration law here in this state in this country i hope we can you know there's some some good minds can get around and think about that so i kind of joke around when i talk about different problems like i always say like people are way smarter than me way more money than me haven't figured out so yet so what, yeah. what chance do i have right <laughs> exactly so and i think it would be great to have people um who have experienced all sides of this come together and maybe there are solutions that are both hu more that kind of elevate humanity but equity and also maybe that keep our borders and safety in mind and it's just that will we can we get in can we get the right people at a table together yeah. where they feel like equals and they feel like contributors um, and then who will listen to those ideas to implement them? So does, so if, um, I'm just putting this out there, USCIS, US government, if we want to do an impact thought on this, we can absolutely, <laughs> I think it's, we need some ideas around this and from people who have lived in and worked in that space. If you could pick one social impact or like one social impact area to like to fix, like you were given the power, any unlimited power, so to speak, unlimited money, and you said you can fix this, do whatever you want to do, what would it be? Ooh. I think lately, a lot of my, I've been thinking a lot about landfills and waste. 
like people don't realize how much waste there is in textiles, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's so much waste in textiles. Yeah. And I I kind of think that there might be a next order of innovation. Um, there's a great company, Aquaga. You may yeah, have no, heard of them. Yeah. Um, and they just had um we had a chance to go to their ribbon cutting for this new machine that they're developing. And they basically remove PFAS. They have a um a proprietary process that removes the PFAS, these forever chemicals, and creates non-toxic byproducts. Um, with the way they're accelerating, they're kind of moving up to an order and scale where they can process, you know, gallons of, of um, this, you know, sludge kind of waste that has probably been accumulating for years and years in a short order, shorter time, maybe over days or weeks of, you know, constantly running their machines. So for me, that's a signal that there's that higher level and order of innovation because they're not going to do it one PFAS at a time. Yeah, no, no. Now they've kind of gotten to a place where they can scale. So I think that even with the landfills, if we get some smart minds and creative process, we might get to an order and scale of which we can actually- There's so much stress out there. Yes, ridiculous. yeah, yeah. And But where we can break things down in a way that we can't one by one by doing beach cleanups. Like it'll, we need the next- five levels up, you know, but I think we'll have to get to that innovation. Like it's not just there, but we'll have to try some things, but people are doing really creative things, but there could be some microorganism that could break down plastic mm -hmm. that, that creates no, that creates no harmful byproducts, but we need to, but to me, I think that waste, because just think about like, we are almost, we're over 8 billion people and we're all creating waste. That waste goes places, it goes like, somewhere. you know, it goes somewhere. It goes somewhere. So I think I'm, I'm really excited around social enterprises that are either using waste materials as their raw materials or are breaking down waste and creating non-toxic products. Those here's one, things are Here's exciting. one for you. So let's suppose there's like 10 social areas, right? Of an impact, right? We'll just say area one, two, three, four, five, six. Eight. Is it better like we're doing now? We're like, like kind of spending time with L10, like, Burden resource one or the other, or is it better like you no, know, just focus on number one, fix it? About then, or fix number one, two through ten, like you know, going off crazy, like, and then fix number one is fixed forever. Go to number two, fix number three, or is it better to do it like we're doing now? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, um, maybe I would have said it's a combination of the both, but like after COVID, like we there was a vaccine of this thing that we didn't even know created in within what a, a year and a half yeah and of course for that some people say you know not good you know, people say it's yeah, good yeah. bad or yeah, yeah. stuff you know but just getting all of those minds together it did save people's yeah. lives you know yeah. I, um, I think you know so so i think um like getting all those minds together to even create a solution mm -hmm. maybe you need to do that with like yeah you know, that's what i'm thinking or maybe so even medicine like you know instead of trying to cure cancer heart disease blah 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 you just we're going to cure cancer first. Then we're going to cure this. Yeah. This, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like that showed that was, I mean, just incredible to think that that innovation, because there's so many processes that need to happen before mm -hmm. something can get to market. And they were able to work together to do that. Multiple companies, multiple yeah. solutions. So it, it just makes me think that it's possible. Yeah. Right. And if for some of these big, but do we have the will to do it? Yes. You know? We have the will, do we have the funding, do we have the urgency that created an urgency because everyone is literally at home. Like, you know, there was a great urgency. Yeah, probably do it worse. The people who make money off this actually want to lose money to do the stuff you know yeah yeah so yeah so yeah I, I, I think and but i think it's never i don't know that it'll ever be done because it's you finish it and then as you learn more and you get more data points you realize you have to change it but maybe you kind of do the big push like mm -hmm. every the big push around this um one cool organization doing some work in this is x prize um and they basically create these moonshot prizes right so and and so they're kind of set up so they're 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 creating the challenge but that challenge invites the innovation. Yeah. And then it's like a multi-million dollar, you know, prize, you know. So I think back in the 1910s, you no know, people were like getting decimated by polio. And I guess someone said I kick polio's ass, the polio pretty much went away, same with all the yes. diseases, you know. Yes, yeah. You no, know, JFK, like you know, we're gonna on the moon for this decade. When, yeah. when we give it a go, we we pretty much like do it, right? But no one's out there saying, you know, for like do this within a certain amount of time, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I those and it's just, just a good reminder that those things are possible. Like I it, and what a moment it must have been to see someone walk on the moon when that just to think that that's like not even in our on our planet. Like you know, like that that's a yeah. moon to our planet and someone is so I think those moments can amaze us that those things are possible, you know. And then it I think that's the whole I'm hoping, like even with the children's book like that you, that the kids have that sense of, oh, I can do this. Like I can, you know, I don't know how, but yeah. it's possible. So 
off, of, off something totally random right a tangent, like, so while the moon, does people still to this day believe the moon's land is fake, right? The earth is flat. Like, I mean, like, I'm mean, like, obviously you look in the sky, all the planets like, you know, round, right? So why are we flat, right? Like, you think people just like, like trying to make trouble, not make trouble, like just like, I won't say that it's smart, but like, how do they get this mindset, right? It's yeah. like, of course, they, of course, some of the questions are like pretty smart, like, okay, like, if the worst person one on the moon, how's the flag already there, right? Or mm-hmm. like, how's this reflected? Of course, always like explanation for the stuff, you know, makes sense, you're right. But like, some people like, no matter what facts you give to me, like, they don't believe it, right? Yeah, yeah, it's hard to know and and um, like how to change someone's mind. I think, um, and it's like you said, it's not even education always because people can feel like education is biased. So I don't know. I, I feel like maybe you have to experience more. Hopefully, maybe as more of yeah. these um trips are going up to the moon yeah. or going out of the you know the the you yeah. know um people like, will like, experience like, that and say, oh, it is. <laughs> I don't yeah. know how else do you do that. So. I listen to podcasts today. They're talking about how people still believe the flat, the Earth are flat. So the guy was like, well, you know who thinks the earth's around? Pilots, you know. Oh, yeah. they, exactly. they, they actually do a yes, flight panel. Exactly. They, they know it's around. I wonder, we should do a Venn diagram. How many how many of, of all of the pilots in, in the in the world, how many of them also think the world is flat? I don't think there's a, a no. cost. So maybe anyone that is like, you know, thinking that if they go through some kind of yeah. training in that school and then they actually have a chance, then they would see, oh, I understand now with physics and how, you know, like how that cannot, those two things cannot coexist, you know, so. I know exactly. Um, so is there anything I sort of asked you that didn't anything else you want to talk about? Um, no, you did a great job, very prepared. <laughs> uh, you're making me feel embarrassed about my production value <laughs> of my podcast with your podcast, but you know, that's okay. <laughs> uh can you share your social media so people can reach out to you? Yeah. Um Innovate Social is spelled I-N-N-O-V, the number eight, S-O-C-I-A-L. And that's we're on Instagram and Facebook and um and LinkedIn. Impactathon also has a social media um, a chan- uh, um, you know, a handle on Instagram and Pineapple Friends also has one. So that's new. There's not much there yet, but we'll, we'll be adding more. Does Innovate Social, does that name like mean anything? Like, yeah. is, it, like is that a story behind it? Yeah, that's, um, it's, I was just telling someone about this the other day. Um, so this area, social entrepreneurship, just like it's under an umbrella called social innovation is how I think of it. When I started learning about the space, social innovation. Um, and that's a very long title, like social innovation for like a website or something. So I thought I like to innovate social and I was going to spell it out, I-N-N-O-V with the, with the spelled out. And when I went to get the URL, someone had just of course. purchased it a couple of months course. before. Of course. I don't know that anyone has built anything on it. So then I was like, okay, now what do I do? Because then I kind of like that name. So then I was like, what if I just turn A-T-E into an eight, innovate social? And then what was great is I worked with a, um, uh, there was a social impact design like um, platform, like, you know, where these designers um, kind of bid on your design projects. It was called Good Joe. One of my friends started that actually. So I used that platform and I kind of said, this is what the thing is. And like, can you design a logo? What I loved is he he took something that I thought was the weakness. The eight was the weakness because it was a compromise. It wasn't what I want. And he kind of made it into the strength of the logo. Cause so now it's like an eight and like, you know, so ever since then it was, it's kind of like, I actually kind of like that there's an eight in it. Like, you know, before I'd always be like, Oh, you know, for SEO, everything, it's not good to have a number, you know, but then I was like, Oh, it's kind of what makes it unique and also shortens it all. Like it takes three letters out, you know? Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the story, but I like it's kind of because inspired by social innovation. Okay. Of course, like design and stuff, logos has important, right? What's something that, you know, we started, Looking back now, you're like, man, I wasted too much time on this. I should have been bam, 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 done with it. I spent like way too much time worrying about it. Oh, so many, everything. Everything, yeah. Everything. Yeah. I mean, I, I always joke now, like if someone's getting into the field of social entrepreneurship, consulting or coaching, I was like, like, let me tell you all the things I, mistakes I made. So you don't need to make them, <laughs> you know, like, let me just, but I, I, I can be, I, it can be, um, I don't know. I, you you name it. I've I've probably made the mistake. I'm probably maybe even still making it. Who knows? <laughs> nice. Um, so can you give us any last minute wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? Yeah. Um, if you have an idea that you want to work on, despite listening to this whole conversation, don't let it stop you from taking the first step. Because just in taking that first step, there's so much you will learn about your the idea about yourself. And everything doesn't need to become a social enterprise or a business, 
but I think that it will strengthen that like muscle to know that you can take an idea and do something with it and amazing things can happen, you know? Um, so I think that I would just say that. So go and do like, you know, in all good things, go and do is what I'll just leave this with. Yutel, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Thanks so much. And so listeners, don't forget to check out our crowdfunder at refunder.com slash Kevin's HR. Thank you for your time and remember to be great every day.